what that is. We're live. Hi, live. Totally rad. Super black awesome. Black. So black I saw the clickbaity thing. I'm like, I'm, I don't know. I'm avoiding watching it just because, like, I don't want to be struck by the mundacity of it all. Um, I just to, asked you about Archuleta if you watched Archuleta's. Oh no! I mean, I want to get it, but um, did you see it? Because uh, the the Cardin team, Team Cardin, like they have a thing where he says a uh, re reformed Egyptian is real, and someone translated it. Like really? I just I won't. It's just a video. It came out three days ago. I haven't even watched it yet. And oh, it's like, that one. What are the chances? Like, I just kind of wonder. Like, first I'm going to listen to that, and it's going to be a lot of double talk, and and then also it's just like like really, are you going to really really stand by that Cardin? Like, or I don't know. Probably. I mean, I watched their. They're having like a March Madness of best evidences for the Book of Mormon. And I watched about two thirds of it. I could only like take so much of it. <laughs> What's the best evidence? Uh, the best evidence is this land that they found called Nahom around Saudi Arabia. And they oh, yeah, some yeah. altar that said that kind of spelled Nahom on it. So, it's, you know, the gigantic, like, I mean, because I, I don't know, I'm not an expert and maybe I'm completely ass backward. But I know about um, in the Afro-Asiatic language family, which is what um, Hebrew and uh, 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 what's the name Aramaic, Egyptian, all of these languages are in the Afro-Asiatic language family, and specifically the Semitic branch, which is the Saudi Arabian branch. It's it has this some um, fun uh, characteristic that almost all of the words, all the little lexemes, they're called. Is um are triconsonantal roots. They're always based on three consonants. All words are built around three consonants. So just that NHM pops up is not crazy, because almost all the combinations of the three consonants in the Semitic language <laughs> become words. You know, so like you yeah, see. okay, so you found one goofy little thing. That's that's really not a lot, especially considering this thing that like yeah, just three consonants. There you go. That's that's all Semitic languages are built around that. You That's know, the number one. Example, SLM is peace or submission. Islam is to submit. Muslim is one who submits. Salama is peace on you, you know, whatever. Like, but the whole point is that SLM is like all of the words to do with peace and submission are built around SL and M. So there you go. Well, choice <laughs> no is homo, spelled, that's right. <laughs> no home it's spelled no homo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that is debunked, unfortunately. I, I think that was the one that they had winning. Some of the rest of them I couldn't. I mean, I, I can't keep them all memorized. They had 16 top contenders, but they were already all pushing for that. It was the number one seed. Yeah. And uh, they were going to have the uh, watchers vote on it. The, another one was that the, the name Soraya supposedly didn't exist, and then they found somebody with the name Soraya. Um, I mean, then there's so many problems like, with that stuff. The rest of them are like all kind of word stuff. It's all word stuff, like yeah. finding a word that kind of matched. Um, yeah, but like the, the part where like a single lick of Hebrew is found anywhere in the New World. That that one, I know they have their weird. They've got their weird stretchy claims, but like no, no, like, it's like it, I don't. I mean, there's obviously ten million reasons why it's clear the story isn't true how the fuck like, the whole idea is like, how do you explain yeah. chiasmus then huh oh yeah i think yeah, yeah exactly right chiasmus. yeah i was like oh, what what he was quoting hebrew scripture <laughs> oh my god where do you get the idea to sound like hebrew scripture was it some from his english is... translation of hebrew scripture <laughs> so, some of it's just so absurd like I don't. I had a seminary teacher one time try to tell me that, like, one of the reasons he was convinced of the Book of Mormon is that Nephi prophesied of Columbus. Did he? Like, yeah, Nephi. Oh, Nephi oh Nephi yeah, talk, yeah, yeah. Nephi talks about, and he's like, "How would he have known?" I was like, "Well, okay. <laughs> Look, I'm I'm full on Mormon right now because I'm yeah. I'm 16 years old, but I know that's a stupid thing you just said." <laughs> Star Trek prophesied the 21st century. I know. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> No, but I was just thinking, like, just the whole thing, like, okay, so, like, Lehi came over, and they, presumably, they spoke Hebrew, or one of the Semitic languages in that area, and then, like, just, like, and then, you know, whole civilization, tens, hundreds, millions of people, apparently, like, I know people have done different, like, 
uh, population estimates. Like, it's just like, how is it that like every little fricking um, whiff of Hebrew just disappears? You know, like, like for example, um, there's like, like the Hittite language is a language that all they know it from is that it pops up in the place names in what is now Turkey. And that like the later languages, I don't even remember which one, like the uh, probably Akkadian or Sumerian or I don't know what. They came along and that became the next language. And that was like the dominant language at the time. And yet they know that Hittite existed because a whole bunch of place names are based on words that aren't words in the later language, you know. And but like that's they they haven't reconstructed the Hittite language. They just know it existed. And but, like there's not the slightest vestige of a S Semitic anywhere in the New World. Like it's a gigantic problem for the Book of Mormon as a literal history. Well, I mean, I listen to all of it, and part of it, I just kind of go, I'm fine that you guys take those as, like, little seeds of possibilities for you yeah, guys, fine. but don't call me an idiot if, like, they don't, but yeah, they, no, would, like, they would call me an idiot. No, that's what I said. That was their entire, this is the show thing that they did. If you ever get a chance to see any of them, it's mostly just them acting like you are a, you are a fucking moron if you fell for the CES letter. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that, that would, yeah. Like, I would most of thoughtful yeah. saints. Like most of them in there be like, oh, can you believe these idiots fall for the it's been debunked? I'm like, what yeah. do you mean by debunked? Like did, yeah. did he not have 33 wives? Like did, was one of them not 14 years old? Those are things that bother people. Was it was the yeah. <laughs> book of Abraham translated by a scroll that actually said that stuff on it? Like the, <laughs> what parts of the CES that are you talking about that were just so thoroughly and obviously it, debunked? It's yeah, it's debunked that there was anything controversial about early Mormonism. That's debunked. I, mean, I felt for a long, long time like really all apologetics is is it it carves out just a little piece of epistemological territory, and you can where they can say like like it's a little defensible piece where like you can't prove that my little piece of epistemological territory, you know, ah yeah, ooh, ah, and it's like yeah okay, I'll grant you that. Like just bear in mind that like I'm, I'm standing on. <laughs> you know the continent of africa and you have you congratulations card and you you've got a square foot that you're standing on nhm there you go but meanwhile the rest of the universe tells us that uh, you know there's not a good reason to believe this now that was uh one of the free books i got is called rainbow history and first off it it starts off with a fucking land acknowledgement right which is <laughs> we acknowledge that this book was written on iroquois blah blah blah, blah or whatever land and it should be given back so okay well first off fucking give it back yeah, i yeah, imagine no. it was written in your house that yeah. you own that you Please, can give show us like that's what i was gonna say it's like you start you be the first one to give it back but then show it was us funny how it's it, done it felt exactly like apologetics and in that like so one of my favorite dan mcclellan moments is when he perfectly telegraph something that he it spoke project projection obviously where he talks about how a lot of people will try to prove that they'll say that this wasn't an impossibility and therefore it's the case or whatever and that's yeah. that's what mcclellan does a lot a lot of times like anytime he doesn't want to say no to something like that i bring it up a lot the whole jonathan and david having a gay relationship thing He's always like, well, it's not impossible. Yeah, we can't exclude and, it. And, well, and it, that, in his mind, that means that both explanations are equally yeah. as as right. valid. I'm like, well, no, they're not. That's not the case. And that's what all this, yeah, this we, we, rainbow we, we, book is so we far. Don't know that doesn't give it. that. Like, if that if the same amount is there for something that faces like a right wing interpretation at oh, all, yeah. he doesn't give that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, but that's all like, this. We, we don't know this, that uh, David wasn't a furry. We don't know that he wasn't a furry. I know. <laughs> no, that's what this book is. This this queer history or whatever, uh, rainbow history. It's basically I only got a couple chapters in, but this it's this lady just kind of she's going through different historical like people and stuff like that and saying, Well, they can't prove that they're not gay. Like there was yeah. these two Egyptians that two Egyptian men that were buried in the same tomb, which is really, really weird. That never happens. Their wives were also buried with them, but they were kind of like behind them. So yeah. we're thinking some people are interpreting that to mean that they were sort of subservient. You can't disprove it. And why do we look at it with, she was like, we always assume that these people are cisgender and heterosexual. Why is that? Like she said that in the book. Why is that? I was like, well, because they probably were. 
I also no. assume they had ten toes. But that's <laughs> also what so much of Foucauldian his story is, as you're finding out right now as you're reading the history of sex. He just like throws a million of those oh, out and presumes that it must be the strange or weird thing. But um, going along with that, there there's so many different areas where where McClellan will just point to something and say, "Oh, it's totally possible." With no, well, I mean, as you were just saying, but then he'll be like a complete pedant and debunk any other thing like like a nut. Yeah. Um, I actually saw somebody kind of make fun of it. Um, I'll pull it up. It's all quiet now. What what's going on in your house that's making that noise? I started a washer. I should go stop it. Oh, that makes sense. It'll stop someday. It's far away. I thought it wouldn't be in the sound, but it is. No, I like. I I feel like it's picking it up through the bass. Is First, that really quick, just to answer choice thing. We'll get into it later. But uh, uh, my uh, my thumbnail here is uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's referencing um, our hero. This, yeah, He's cutting and brave. Still waiting for an answer. She'll never. I don't think she'll ever answer me. Oh no. You remember that one? Because like, it, was, it was from like it's been a couple years. Because it was when I was watching her on uh, I was watching on Mormon stories, and she said, you know, talking about Joseph Smith and uh, Mary and fourteen years old olds, and she says, well, fourteen year olds can't consent to sex. So I asked her, can fourteen year olds consent to sex changes? Just still waiting. She will not say. Well, the professionals, okay, but if what if we found professionals, if we can that would claim that they can consent to sex? Because that's always the answer you get is like, well. They work with their doctors and their parents. I'm like, okay, <laughs> what if I found you a professional and a parent who both says my 14 year old kid can consent to sex? <laughs> Would you be cool with that, huh? Yeah, I hope I, not. I, I really I mean, it's like, hope yeah. not. It's like, yeah, because that's the whole, the whole point. Like, you can condition kids into a lot of things, you know. Like, I mean, I don't know. It's just in the news, obviously, and I've been thinking about it. Like, this, like the whole moral conundrum of uh like you know like in the israel palestine conflict because and look it up there's even a wikipedia or wikipedia article about it but hamas and child suicide bombers particularly like and just child suicide bombers in general it's like the the moral goofiness of like okay so like let's say you have very good intentions or intelligence that this 12 year old is on their way to blow himself up on a bus in tel aviv you know it's like well like trolley problem right <laughs> you know oh, yeah. Uh, yeah all right here's somebody making fun of uh dan yay i'm a scholar of the bible and religion and the fit for this video is the chili peppers Fuck this is just you. pure and utter nonsense and the reason why it's just pure and utter nonsense is because only half of the text is being quoted and the creator of this video knows that only half of the text is being quoted here. And when we look at the data, what we read is the red hot chili peppers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty good. Like, I'm glad he picked something totally neutral just to expose the pattern. Like, just that, that this is literally a formula that he does, you know? <clears throat> Yeah, we so you mentioned uh, what the authors could original originally meant to put there. Also, like, I mean, it makes sense that he's a Peppers fan. Like, yeah, hey, like the Peppers. You. I'm gonna go Careful, burn Kevin's all of Kevin's my chili Peppers fan. Uh -huh. yeah, like, I'm gonna go burn like, all no, my chili Peppers shirts now. Yeah, don't no, take care of that. Anyway, I, I'm a John Frusciante fan. Oh like, yeah. I, like I, I, I tolerate the papers. I tolerate the peppers because I like John Frusciante's guitar playing. But other than he that, came, like he came back and I've I was said really it before. I said it again. You got to give Flea some credit. Oh, Flea's Flea's good. But I so I, Frusciante came back and I was excited. And then their latest album just kind of sucked. Shocking. I like double album. Oh man, double shit. <laughs> I like. <laughs> I like by the way, and I like Californication. And I like Stadium Arcadium, and that's about it. You know, like I don't know, like I like I wouldn't mind if somebody just released like like drum bass John Frusciante and just like just the flip the flip version of no Chili just no Peppers. Anthony Kiedis that's the yeah pretty much just like just none of this none of the words and most he's, of the songs just I'll just, give just you this, John he's a little noodling. he's a little pretentious I'll give you that I have watched him a couple and he's a terrible lyricist you know yeah no that's, that's what I get is like yeah just the lyrics are just so. 
freaking inane. Yeah, and then he at one point I, I'm watching an interview with him, and he's like, <clears throat> and then that's when it hit me that that Danny in Danny California was the same as Danny in. By the way, it's the same. Like, <laughs> shut the fuck up, man! Just... Oh, wow. I've, I've, I've told this read. story before. I think every time Chili Peppers comes up, in fact, I think every time Chili Peppers comes up, we run through the same <laughs> thing that you guys like. Pasante, ah, we got to give Felice some credit. Ah, but he just sucks. But he is also like knows that he sucks. That's one thing that's kind of endearing about him. Like he'll talk yeah. about like he knows that his lyrics are, are BS, and he also <laughs> knows that he's not that good of a singer, and he'll. He'll reference it, but also, yeah. that's why in their older stuff he chanted more. Um, I don't, yeah, like peppers are like they don't, they don't make my bones itch the way three eleven does. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, dude, that was three eleven um, was big in my high school. Oh, it's huge, and it's still huge. My girlfriend in high school was crazy for him. But um, and that's why I've been to more three eleven concerts than any other concert. Really? But, that's so sad. That's but like... um, the uh. On my mission, my companion, I had an interview with him on here. He was a, he was a nutty guy. He's the guy I told you about who came in singing the guitar song, No Zone Leader, No Cry, into like his own leader. And uh, he bought the Chili Peppers Californication album because it came out when we were on our mission. And we were, we he said, I'm not going to listen to this. I'm not going to listen to this. You know, he's a Cajun, so I'm not going to listen to this. You know, just talking like that. And, promising he was going to save it to the end of his mission he was only like three months out so yeah he's going to save that like a year and a half or something like that then one morning not one morning probably the next morning pretty quickly like 5 a.m i just hear the start of california fornication suddenly start in the other room and he comes out and he's just dancing like crazy like that like 5 a.m and just all around the world you can make time he just He's just going crazy for it. And then he just stops. He goes, I'm weak. I'm weak. I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it that the, because I know you sent it to me years ago. Was it a stand up comedian or somebody? Like, it was like a little meme thing where he says, like, anywhere I am in the world, uh, it doesn't matter where I am. If I'm standing next to a speaker and I say, what is this shit? The answer is always red hot chili peppers. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Croissant Butcher says, uh, isn't Sublime mostly awful too, guys, don't you think? Um, I wonder what that guy would be doing if he'd stayed alive. Because I don't think he would have stayed yeah. on that reggae-ish stuff. You but... know, a few weeks ago, I was just like, I, on a whim, I was just like, you know, I've never listened to the Blind Melon album. You know, like, because I, you know, No Rain is a great song, and I heard it 50,000 times on the bus ride to junior high. And then um, the, um, the Blind Melons cover of uh, Three is the Magic Number from School's House Rock is just a fantastic cover. <laughs> it's a really great rendition of that song. And so, like, I, yeah, I listened to the, the album, and I didn't realize, like, they're really more of a hard rock southern psychedelic band. You know, like, the No Rain kind of gave them kind of like a, 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 I don't know. Did kind you of ever a listen to Sugar Ray sound. albums? <laughs> listen no. to Sugar Ray. They got those, like, those like top 40 hits that are like those like every morning there's a halo yeah. hanging from the corner the rest of their albums are metal just like straight are you serious? Yes. my yes. boss <laughs> my boss weird. is an old local rocker who, who was around the utah scene for decades and he talked about how like you know like in the early 90s uh better than ezra opened for his band in saint george and wow. he, like he said, because remember, he's thinking, like, Man, these guys are weird. Like he said, they're really nice guys and they put on a hell of a show, but they were rocking, rocking, rocking guys. And he remembers like six months later, he's like listening to the radio and it's like, and that was Sugar Ray. And he was like, what the fuck happened? You know, but I mean, they they sold out and or figured let's make money, however you want to call it. Um, but, you know, cause that, the, the two Sugar Ray hits, those are two of the worst things in my life <laughs> i i want to leave the room when they're on there's there's so many like there's so many bands that i i might hate if i gave them a chance you know like and i don't know why i said and better than that, that. And, i think so, yeah. i think bradley noel and, had talent well at, beyond that too every one of these bands are full of people with talent and like, oh, yeah, 311 is another band. one three like 311 yeah, everybody loved them when i was when i was in high school and then i I was like, okay, everybody likes him. I'll listen to his song. And I listened to one song and I was like, 
I don't really like this. And so I'd never listen to another one. Like, and that was it. So I don't know. Maybe they're great. No, see, like, that's because I've tried. Like that I did I gave it the college try, you know, like 20 years after they were popping in the 90s. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna listen to as much as I can of I even asked my friend, <laughs> Chris knows who I'm talking. Like, we've nearly lost this guy nearly cut us both off. You might listen. <laughs> yeah. But because I asked him, like, what's the good one? Like, what's the, where should I start with 311? And I really, really gave it the shot. I just, just can't take it. And, you know, because, you know, because sometimes at work, I like to do the challenge. Like, you know, what's the worst band ever? And the qualifying is like, it can't just be like a band that is talentless and hackish or is like, it has to be a band that's seriously trying and has a real following. Because, like, for me, like, the, the worst band that is like a real band that is talented and has a real following is 311. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I think they're talented guys, and they they write a lot of songs, and they play really well. And like Peanut can play bass super well, and I yeah. wish they could harmonize the way S.A. harmonizes sometimes. Oh, yeah. Did you know that like, the uh, you know like, what's this? Uh, what's the band? Closing time. I don't, the, 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 yeah. the, I don't, I don't remember them, but they're not third. I do know they something. I watched. Uh, you know, Todd in the Shadows. Todd in the Shadows has a real good uh, you YouTube know, channel. He talks about one hit wonders. That guy went on to write most of the pop music that you know of in this. Yeah, story. no, he wrote. Oh, um, he wrote that big Adele song. Like, the yeah, he wrote Daughter, like everything for all the, like the top forty like the, pop chicks. The four non blondes lady. Yeah, that lady. Like has written number ones for like Pink and uh, whatever the top forty chicks. Yeah, like, the, the dude who did Closing Time wrote all the songs for like Katy Perry. Semi Sonic. Yeah. Uh, Semi Sonic. Uh, what's closing his name? Time, from I did my... learn that Closing Time is actually about his grandfather's funeral. It is, which gives it a very different feeling when you listen. Really, to it. I yeah. thought it was a bar song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I just thought it was a dumb bar song, but like apparently, like I don't know, I read it in one of those dumb lists of like, what's the song really about? The other one I thought was interesting was um, which I also think is a pretty good song, is that Fastball. They were another one hit wonder, but um, the the they made up their minds and they got to talking. That what's the chorus? You guys know what I'm talking about. I don't know. Okay. Um, you guys know that song. How, th th what's the chorus? I know you guys know that song. I can't think of the chorus all of a sudden, but like. Cause you know it sounds like a song. It sounds like a road trip song. Like oh, young people, they're out on a road trip, and it's about a real life story in Texas where like this elderly couple, just for reasons that are mysterious to this day, just drove into nowhere, got out of their car, and started walking to the desert, and then they were found dead in the desert, hand in hand. Weird thing. So we're getting a lot of push. A lot of people in the uh, comments like Three Eleven and the Chili Peppers. And yeah, no, I know, I know. Like I'm like I'm in the minority there. Like, I mean, they were super duper big, fat, um, popular bands. And they're big Mostly. in Brazil. Hedgehog. <laughs> and they say they're fun. Uh, what's his name from Sugar Ray? He became, became like a commentator on E and all that stuff. But for a while, he used to come on Corolla's podcast all the time. And he'd always gripe about how all the money he made counted nothing for his wife and kids, like zero. <laughs> he says, it was a checkbox. Now you shut up and go away. <laughs> you just go in and complain about it all the time. <laughs> it's pretty funny. You want to know what, uh, so speaking of one hit wonders, I think the, some of the worst lyrics I've ever heard, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, you, you think about the lyrics, it's like, you say the world has come between us, our lives have got between us, we're falling apart. And like it's it's all about like they're stressing out about if they're gonna survive and and then the chorus yeah. is um I said what about breakfast at Tiffany's you said I think I remember that film ah uh, yeah as I recall I think we both kind of liked it and I yeah, said but I think the whole both, thing was like they were a couple that couldn't yeah. get along and he was trying to find the one thing that no that, I know I understand that it was just like it was no it was, it was a little bit, bit like yeah it's just tiny, a little bit like singing the conversation yeah it's it's singing mm -hmm. uh, like three sentences of a conversation <laughs> I'm just like that's the, the stupidest thing it may be like, like, that's like, like a like passing lyric well. but not like the hook to repeat or something there's a band that nobody but me has ever listened to that I really really like they put out one album that I think is really really great and they're called Wolf Suka. And the guy has a very kind of improvisational lyrical style like that. And, but, and like, but for him, I don't know how to describe it. You'd have to listen to it. But like, uh, he's got a song called You Are the One. And it's a dopey love song. But it's got like one of the lines in it that I just love so much. He just says, you're going to take a job counting fish, literally counting fish one at a time, instead of staying here with me, making love and writing poetry or, you know, whatever. But like the way it's just sung out, it was like this because it's, you know, it, it just is so endearing where it's like, you can tell it's like this because it's somebody in college 
It's like, you're going to fly off to Alaska and you're going to take a job counting fish, literally counting fish <laughs> one at a time I instead love of it. staying here with me. And it's, it's wonderful. Like now if Sugar Ray did it, it would sound like shit. <laughs> but this wolf suka guy is the kind of like I would Woody say like Allen most like the guy. mountain goats music's all this kind of conversational stuff like that too, and he's just got lyrics and wind. Yeah, and but they kind of pretty, work pretty good. Well, see, yeah. that's like, like so I was also thinking like Frank Black, where like I mean, so like I'm thinking like songs that I've been listening to since 1995. That like just in the last few years, I'm like, what is he saying? And I look up the actual lyrics on the internet because also that wasn't available in the 90s. And it's funny because like when you just read them on the page, it's just doofy weirdness but the way he like puts them in the whole context with the music and his tone and everything and it just gives it like this unbelievable power and depth of meaning and i mean it's a bit like john lennon you know like um, the way by fastball is what you're thinking that's the one yeah the way but where were they going without ever knowing the way that one oh i do know that one song. yeah i know everyone knows that song it has a pretty good little solo in it like i guess i just don't know more most of it Smashing Pumpkins still a goat, and I don't care if I'm the only one who was. I I love Smashing Pumpkins. I was a huge Smashing Pumpkins fan back in the I the love day. that song. It's off one of their newer albums, actually. Silvery Sometimes, really fucking good song. Uh, I, I like that he day. became a WWE owner and writer, <laughs> like started working for wrestling really? and all that stuff. Yeah, and then he also appears on Alex Jones all the time. I, I know he's funny. like, I know he's like a Nazi, basically. <laughs> Hugo Bardello, though. There's another I one mean, where he's, like he's like dumb a Nazi well. Guy. <laughs> the, like the Gogol Bordello where it's like I mean and it's like because like the way the guy screams it it's really great but the lyric is just like have you ever been to American wedding where is vodka where is marinated Harry and it's <laughs> the, way, the way he puts it out there is just wonderful <laughs> I don't know I love lyrics lyrics like that are always great but yeah I mean pumpkins I, I love the pumpkins back in the day they kind of like kept like a Beatles Beatlesy feel into all their stuff but yeah, that's another um, one, like I never was were into the pumpkins. Like I never bought the albums and listened to them in the nineties. But you know they were on the, um, on the radio everywhere. So like I don't know, five ten years ago, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna listen to Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. I just it doesn't. Speak oh, to I me. love that. I love that album. It's a double album, but I always had a problem with it. It was a little bit too much of like heavy, soft, heavy, soft, heavy, soft. I kind of wish they arranged the album a little bit differently, but. Um, I, I loved it back in the day, but uh, I, I went and rewatched that one. Um, we shall never be apart, and, and it has like a music video with it. It's good crap, man. It's really good. I mean, I, I, I like that stuff, but um, he, their story of him kind of becoming like a douche to the band and all that stuff, he'd do stuff like record all their parts. When when you're listening to Smashing Pumpkin stuff, you're listening to almost all Billy Corgan because he wouldn't let them record yeah, on really? the stuff. Yeah, and they, that's one of the reasons they had like big fallout fights and all that stuff. But I mean, Eha yeah. got back with them, but the bassist won't get back with them. Never. 1979 is a good song. Yeah, Adore. Adore is the name yeah, of the song I'm like, talking the, about. I love Adore. It's a good song. Tonight and 1979 are the songs, and I'm like, I like this song. Oh, well, really we were talking about in high school. We back when we were in high school, like all our school dances, we'd still like look back to the 80s and we'd like pick some Journey song or some shit. We think like, well, why didn't we pick something like the pumpkins like tonight, tonight, or something like that? We didn't do anything that was of our era at the time frame. But I don't know. That's what, you know what I hated is when I was a missionary, because I was a missionary from 99 to 01, and 87% of all missionaries in their last zone conference would quote the freaking green green day time of your life song oh, yeah. Yeah. and i just wanted to kick him in the nuts like right there in the chapel just walk right up to the podium and kick him in the nuts it was even put in the Seinfeld finale man we were uh <laughs> yeah i so i think you guys were probably like the last generation that grew up with good music on the radio because yeah. we well did. because we grew up with the radio <laughs> yeah. yeah but i grew up with a radio and it was dog shit for the most part like they had there was very, very rarely a song on the rough. radio that I like. Yeah, yeah, it was no, fucking I, tough. I remember as a little kid listening, and I, I didn't have any CDs or anything at the time, so I, I just just listened to the radio. And my God, it every now and then you'd get like a Mr. Brightside on there, and I love that mm -hmm. song. Every now and then you would get it's like uh, new metal, new good metal or whatever. Happy. But yeah. then fuck, it was terrible. It like, and part of that is Idaho has terrible radio stations. But the country was all dog shit. Uh, the pop was all dog shit. The alternative was that? okay, but I don't There's know. There's a documentary on like the 1999 Woodstock where all the new metal people came and just like burned the whole thing down. Have you guys really? seen that documentary? No, yeah. Yeah. It's so bad because. But so I haven't like, listened to the radio since I was like 11. 
because that... I'm old enough to remember when X96 was an independent radio station run by free-minded disc jockeys who got to pick their. their you remember Richie Stedman remember was on that. that cultural hall was a, was the voice of that. By the time he was there, though, they were already clear channel corporate nightmare media, whatever it was. Yeah, like I remember, like listen, like I remember over a period, like you know, it was like a slow death for me, but like, it, like just finally, like I got to the end. I think it was like two thousand three, two thousand four, where I'm like, God, Radio from Hell is just shit now. It's just shit. It went from being like, it's like, I, in fact, I have to add that to the list. Like the downfall of Simpsons, Weezer, and Radio from Hell. Like <laughs> from the greatest heights to the lowest lows. Because radio, mm. radio from Hell is still around, like the Simpsons. They're just still around. I'm yeah, like, I can't believe they keep going. They actually yeah. got in like some big fight with Stedman too. Like he's not friends with them anymore and left them and all that stuff. But I, kinda, I don't know. They seem to have like I, I don't know. I I used to play chess and drink coffee with the late Jeff Vice, who was um a local movie reviewer who was buddies with the Radio from Hell guys. And like I mean, he didn't. It's not like it's not like he just had a lot of dirt. But I remember him saying something about like eh, there, yeah, that like I because I remember specifically saying like I'm I, I'm tired of listening to Radio from Hell because I'm tired of hearing listening to them whine about their contract negotiations. And Jeff Weiss was like, they are all making six figures, and mm -hmm. they are they are all some of the top paid radio people in the country, and they are just whiners. I remember so Colt. Richie Stedman has his podcast called Culture Hall, which is not the Culture Hall, which is the one that we were uh, making fun of for his uh, bad satire <laughs> music. And yeah. I was going to, I mean, I have it all written out. Maybe I'll still do it. But the I was going to make a song of uh, that Richmond, north of Richmond, and say Culture Hall's <laughs> like not Ricky Stedman. <laughs> and I still need to do that song. I got like even like an orange beard and hair to do it with. So I, I'm going to do a satire song of that. But I know that was um, everybody was saying like, like, do you think you could do better? And usually, usually I'm like, I try to be humble there, but I'm like, well, yeah, probably impromptu, man. This is terrible. Yeah. Well, that's, Chris is going away because this reminds me of talking about terrible. I wondered if he knew anything about this because I the Nick Swarsden thing. Do you follow that, Chris? The Nick, that weird Nick Swarsden thing where he got taken off a stage and like, cause, like, you know, Originally, like, I didn't just kind of think, like, was it like some kind of woke censorship thing, you know, that kind of thing? And apparently not, like, from what little I can hear about it, like, a, like, like, and I guess he apologized, like, I drank and took Ambien or something like that, I can't remember, or took, it took weed or something like that, and Ambien, I don't know. But, like, apparently, like, he was just so horrendously bad that the house was like, good night, we're sorry, everybody, <laughs> you'll get a refund. And, yeah. Do you know, yeah, did you follow, it was like, it was like three or four no, weeks I haven't ago. heard about that. Like but there's is, some there's like some viral video theater? people took of him like in, but like nobody's got I haven't seen any audio or video of the set itself just people saying that like it was weird it was rambling it was dark and nobody like people were confused anyway I don't know is he uh is he any good stand up I remember 20 years ago I remember him being really really funny he and I know funny. he was friends with Norm McDonald and Norm seemed to pick good friends but I don't know I because yeah, he's Ronald always in the Charlie movies. He's always in like shitty Adam Sandler movies playing a really, really oh, yeah, no, dumb well that that's most working yeah. stand ups. That's that's the Adam Sandler thing. Yeah, that's why he's yeah. the most popular man in Hollywood is because he keeps I've heard from around the way that he's one of the industry's best kept secret in the closet people that he's for sure gay. Yeah. Sandler? No. Swarsden. Um, oh, yeah. Swarsden's gay. <laughs> yes, he was yeah, funny was on a, funny. what was that cop show? That cop show. He was he always uh, did like, Reno nine one one. Yeah, the he was the roller skate guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, gay. Yeah. Like if you can roller skate that well, like especially because like I'm sure he was <laughs> like I, I doubt that Reno nine one one was like who do we get to play the speedo roller skates gay guy. Nick Swarzen. No, I mentioned Nick Swarzen called him up and they're like, you know, he's like, hey, Nick, you want to roll? He's yes, like, yes. Please. I want to be the roller skate guy. What was that Sandler spinoff movie? Why would you, why would you it, be? It wasn't Sandler. It was all his friends about like video game guy who like oh. writes video games. It was super. I don't uh, know that one. It was a funny he's, movie. It had Swarzen. You're not, talking about, uh, you're not talking about Pixels, are you? That's not a spinoff. No, 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 no. That's that, how shitty. Sandler wasn't even in it, but it was all of Sandler's spinoff friends. Me. 
me and Morgan like watching shitty movies for fun, right? And so we used to, a safe bet is always a modern Adam Sandler movie that'll be really, really stupid and bad. But my God, we got to Jack and Jill. Holy fuck, we couldn't even, like, it, it was so bad, it wasn't even fun to watch. Have you watched the state. Red Letter Media review of that movie? I think I have. It's been a long the, time. It's a two-part review. It's funny. It's like It's one of the only re- movies that they actually did two s- separate reviews. Like One of them is just <laughs> the review of the terribleness boy. of the movie. Oh, yeah, Grandma's Boy. But then the other one is like they really just talk about like kind of how like, Adam Sandler movies are I mean, they're not it's illegal. An excuse. It's an excuse like it's, to go no, on a trip with well, his it's friends. Not, it's not illegal, but it is kind of a big scam because that's things they talk about how like Jack and Jill looks like it has it has the production quality of an snl skit it's but terrible. that movie it cost 80 million dollars <laughs> jesus christ right but that's things like the rlm guys go into this where they probably they talk about like you know 20 million dollars is probably adam sandler's acting fee and then he's a writer and a director and a producer and those are all different checks right and so like the reality is they probably make the movie for like five to ten million dollars most of that is like location stuff you know, that's things like you'll <laughs> yeah. notice like a lot of Adam Sandler movies. Oh, like, I shot at a resort. Yeah. Shot a that, resort. So like it's a great deal because like like everybody's like, hey, basically you come on vacation, you work a little bit, we'll cut you a check for fifty thousand dollars and give you a car. Like Adam Sandler's like <laughs> and then he's like <laughs> then he's like, Oh, and when, in this one I'm gonna be married to Selma Hayek. I have it's to one be. of the reasons that they say Sandler's a mensch because he took all of his friends from yeah. NYU acting school and he keeps them employed. No, but that's things like career. yeah, yeah, like but that's the yeah, that's one of the things RLM was talking about. Because, like, it's hard to, like, you, you can't look at Adam Sandler and say, like, how dare you, you dickhead. Like, people are willing to pay for him to do anything. Yeah. You know, you so, like, in that sense, like, those. in the sense that, like, he keeps all of his friends employed and, and keeps, you know, because also I'm sure it's good for their um, ticket sales to see when they pop it up in a movie and if they've got a funny part, you know, like, and yeah, so in that's way, like, he's a total mensch. It's just that it's, and the, the RLM guys talk about that too. Where it's like, like, because like Sandler can be very, very, very funny, but he just oh, yeah. isn't most of the time. Well, and he's actually really yeah. good in movies that he's just the actor. You know, like Punch yeah. Drunk Love is awesome. Yeah, yeah. I've heard Uncut but, Gems was yeah. great. I didn't watch it though. There was I one mean, the diaries of something that had a uh, uh, Ben Stiller and um, oh, what's his name? Uh, it is really good. Uh, well, like um. I don't. I doubt anybody has watched ever, especially or recently, the Psycho franchise, one, two, and three. Because a few week, month, weeks or months ago, or whatever, I watched the entire Psycho franchise, and I, what I find so weirdly fascinating, and I'd love to like. I don't. I, I, maybe somebody has some inside information. Maybe I'll find a documentary someday. But it's so weird because like, okay, so first Psycho, Hitchcock, Lightning in a Bottle, one of the greatest things ever, and Anthony uh, Perkins. You know, incredible portrayal, really fantastic. You know, in Psycho 2, Anthony Perkins, if anything, is better because, for one thing, his you know, his character's role is expanded, he has a lot more lines in the second one, and it's not a terrible movie, actually. Um, and yeah, and his acting is fantastic in Psycho 2. In Psycho 3, Anthony Perkins was the director, and if you watch Psycho 3, like if you would like juxtapose just scenes of Anthony Perkins in Psycho 2 and Psycho 3, you'd think like this isn't the same show. This isn't the same character. This is you'd, you'd struggle to think it was the same actor because the, the delivery in Psycho 3 is so bad. Like, you know, like in a, like Curb Your Enthusiasm where the like they're, he's forced to hire the, the Mexican girl who's not an actress. Like, I don't know if you, have you guys see that because mm-hmm. this actor, does, the, the Mexican girl does a great job of acting like a bad actress. Like, yeah, Anthony Perkins, when he directed himself, is utter shit. Like, comically, (laughs) hugely, bizarrely bad. And it's kind of weird, because, like, Anthony, you got wonderful reviews for your portrayal of Norman Bates in the first two Psychos. Why didn't you just keep running with that? Like, but when he got the reins, it just turned into something else. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe Sandler does it for other people. And I, but the Meyerwitz stories is the one I'm thinking about. It had Dustin Hoffman in it, and he probably would have won some awards, but he got Me too right at the start of it. Do you remember when uh, Dustin Hoffman suddenly got Me too All these women. It was some woman who said that, like, when he was acting on Broadway, that he got overly handsy with her backstage or something like that, and he got Me too out of it. Um, then 
this kind of ties into something else. He was in Spanglish. Spanglish is pretty good, and it was directed by Frank Oz. And this is me uh, tying stuff back into uh, Mormon stuff because we've gone off on a tangent here. But oh, yeah. uh, the uh, <laughs> Frank Oz just recently directed uh, this one film called In and of Itself. And uh, <laughs> In and of Itself was mentioned by one Bill Real as something that everybody should watch. Here, I'll pull that up. Oh, here it oh, is. Yeah. <laughs> This is directed by Frank Oz, the guy from the Muppets and all that stuff. Um, if you're ever going to follow up on one recommendation of mine, it is this. Make sure that you have a couple of hours completely uninterrupted at a time and turn on Hulu's in and of itself. If you have access to a legal way to alter your consciousness, add that in too. And then I want to see everyone's comments below who has watched this. Well, I didn't have an altered state of conscience, but I did watch it. And now I don't like Frank Oz. No, I'm just kidding. Like <laughs> oh, that's too bad. <laughs> no, I, I like Frank Oz, but but I do have to point something out to you because, like, that tangent was actually Mormon related because that's exactly how priesthood quorum goes. Mm. <laughs> they all end up rating rating the worst '90s punk rock <laughs> bands in order. So this movie, Bill Real, when I watched it, this is uh, basically like Chris Angel mind freak magic. That's what it was. I'm not joking that it was just mind trick magic. <laughs> it was card tricks and some of those other like mind trick magics of like, oh, I made you draw something that was actually, you didn't realize that you're picking up a letter that somebody wrote you from your family. And it's all obviously like planted stuff. To me, it's like, it's basically like Jim Baker Christian stuff. And everybody's supposed to write down their identity and they write down their identity. And we got this whole audience and at the end of it. He goes and says to each one of them what they wrote down on their paper or what their identity was. And it's so obviously like a Jim Baker thing of like somebody's got something in his ear or something, or he took the time to memorize what every single person in his chair was before the thing or something like yeah. that. But I, Bill Gates was in the audience. Larry Wilmer was in the audience. Like all these famous people were in the audience. And uh, Bill Gates wrote down that I am a leader. And Larry Wilmer wrote down, I am an oracle. I'm like, okay, you, you, you narcissistic douches. But I, I watched this and it was crap magic, Bill, with, with some sappy identity stuff and a bunch of constructivism in it. Because uh, there's just there's just some basic ass identity constructivism in it, as you could imagine. But um says, damn it, that's what I'm gonna be watching in an altered state tonight, says uh says Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, check it out. But I mean, I watched it, I'm like, this is just a magic show, it's just a magic show, man. <laughs> like, like, why are you getting into it? This is like if you think this is like so amazing, you would think like mega church stuff is amazing because like he just had stuff planted in the audience. So he knew what the people said and wrote and then wowed them that he knew what they said and wrote. And I was showing you guys that like the new. So wait, was it, it wasn't like a, a fictional thing. It was it was an actual. It was a magic show. Like, I'm not kidding. It was just a magic show. Like I was showing you. Some but just stuff taking just just taking itself way too seriously. Just like magic that doesn't that with no conceit to this is entertainment. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it, and it was like talking about identity and like how you construct your identity and who, who your identity was. So it has all that yeah. stuff in. So it's, it, was was a, it was a gimmick and mother and all this stuff. And it was a, a gimme a gimmicky relief society lesson. Type yeah, thing. it was a gimmicky relief society lesson, and it, it was this type of magic. I showed you guys this yesterday, but it was basically this type of like mind freak magic. I want to look through and just think of any one of those. I didn't see this. Ice cold, under pressure. I like what I'm seeing. Hold them, put them in your hands, and then put your other hand on top, kind of like a, a twist it, like a pancake, so we can't see anything. Can't get to them, nothing. All right, fair? Think red, black. Think hearts, diamonds, club spades. See that reaction, that flinch? I know which way you're throwing the ball. It's a diamond, am I right? Yeah. I'm gonna do you one better than guess it. I'm gonna find it. Hold your hands tight. Don't take it out, don't move, don't move. Let me reach in just a little. I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna go there. 22 down, I'm gonna go down. Tell us all, out of that whole deck, don't move. What card do you think of? Say it. Three of diamonds. Three of diamonds. Oh. Ah. And he, so, he was using cards. A goldfish. A goldfish. Yes. Seriously? Yes. I got you. Look in your hands, Aaron. <laughs> so it was totally just stuff like that, you know. And, uh, 
Yeah, that is Chris Angel. That was exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's, it's the magic stuff that like you you surprise people with something that you pre planted or pre did, or you probably have somebody in on it with you in the oh, team. Yeah. And uh, what what streamo channel is Lawrence of Arabia on? Uh, he posted it. Uh, he in, posted uh, one in the longhouse. I didn't watch oh. it. I do want to watch. I'm I'm gonna watch it. Yeah. Um, it's just. You said just I, I got to watch it on the big screen and and real deal, and yeah. so uh, I got to get it up on my big screen and watch it right. So, but anyway, that movie stunk, and it, it of course talked about constructivism, like in the sense he talked about like the elephant, the you know the elephant and all the different people feeling the elephant. Like you have ten different blind men feeling the elephant on a different side. And one says, it's like a brick wall. And another one says, it's like a bunch of tree trunks. And another one says, it's a snake. And, you know, he says, but what does the elephant think when the people are sitting there saying he's all these different things? Does the elephant think I'm a snake? I'm a tree trunk? I'm a brick wall? And what if it really was some other sort of monster? And because other people said it was an elephant in the end of stuff, it changed what it was. And it just walked off thinking that it was just an elephant, you know, constructivism stuff. I, I've been thinking about this crap kind of a lot lately with them um, oh let me see if i can look at this so there's some stuff with constructivism that kind of drives me nuts because we're already on like all the constructivism like what, how they talk about it with um what you call with, love was invented with, by uh, guys like trans me. stuff and all that sort here's of a deal, quote of my, quote there, there's my, there's this love affair that the left has with it too and this, this kind of sums it up here's right a quote here. that might haunt you for the rest of your life because here's a quote that might here's a quote you. that might haunt you for the rest of your life what you call love was invented by guys like me to sell nylons. That is from the show Mad Men, which was actually full of lines like that. And if you only know the show from the memes, or if you think it's just kind of a soap opera that was <laughs> in the 1960s where a bunch of handsome people all have affairs with one another, the show is actually really interesting because it is trying to answer the question, why is the world like this? Why are people like this? And its answer is that in the post-war years, there was a small group of advertising executives who basically created a template for what a modern life was supposed to look like. That up to this point, the world had things like tradition and religion and culture that taught people how to live their lives. But along came this era of television and mass media and consumerism where people had more spare time and more spare money. And what this show is saying is that at this point, a certain group of people came in and kind of took the controls of the culture. These were the advertisers. Because the way they were going to sell you products was by saying, here is a portrait of what your life should look like. And it includes a car and a house and a picket fence and a boat and a pool and on and on and on. The main character is Don Draper. And his whole method for selling products is saying, this product will fill the emotional void in your life. And the way it will fill that void is by boosting your self-image in the eyes of everyone around you. In other words, don't buy this car because it's a good car or because it's comfortable. Buy it because you want to demonstrate to the people around you what kind of person you are. Look how fancy these shoes are. Don't you want everyone to know that you're the type of person who wears these shoes or drinks this brand of beer? This was the beginning of people defining their personalities by what they consume. So if you're asking yourself, why do people rush out to buy the latest model of this Stanley Cup when they have 12 more just like it at home? And it's because decades ago, people like this convinced them that this is how you define your personality, by this thing you are holding in your hand. But the problem is, Don Draper is miserable. None of this fills the hole inside him. The beautiful, Crazy. perfect wife, the beautiful, perfect yeah. house and car and children, none of it does anything for him because he's reaching a point in his life where he realizes that he has poured so much energy into the presentation, into convincing other people of what kind of guy he is, that he never spent time actually becoming that guy, that he has a mask with no face behind it. You're born alone and you die alone, and this world just drops a bunch of rules on top of you to make you forget those facts, but I never forget. And what the show is saying is that makes him perfect for advertising in the consumerism era because he is creating a population of people just like him. When the counterculture came along and tried to reject all of these ideas about capitalism and consumerism, the advertisers just swallowed them up along with everything else. 
the final shot of the series is Don Draper making that Coca-Cola ad with a bunch of hippies on a hilltop singing about peace while holding <laughs> their bottles of Coke. There is a reason why this show won a lot of awards but was not watched by very many people. So I think that show kind of sum summarizes what lefties think uh, in general. I think it's overstated. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, like this, I mean, because forever, like I lefties think that right, like conservative radio talk show and now TV, they think like they set the agenda, like Rush Limbaugh, exactly. like the people tune into Rush and now they know what to think because Rush said it. It's like, no, Rush is a mirror. Exactly. And and that the your it, perfect wording. Yeah. The mirror is what advertising used to be. It used to give people what they already wanted yeah. or kind of gear itself towards what <laughs> might be idyllic to them to get them to purchase something. Yeah. And this is some of the hubris of modern day, current day advertisers or tastemakers, or like we see of all the people who are in the uh you know, the sweet baby thing with the uh video games. They yeah. think yeah. that, that the madmen had that type of control to create yeah. society that way. And yeah. now they have control to create it in their new image. And no, you don't because now you actually are trying to alter it. Whereas at that time that you were trying to reflect it, it's, it's yeah. overstated. It's over. No, it's, it's, it's not as it's so ridiculous. As that. It's like, you know, like soldier coming home from Europe, 1945. He's like, well, I never, I never even thought I wanted a suburban home, a car, and a refrigerator until Don Draper told me so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I didn't think I wanted a beautiful wife and kids until. Yeah. It, I mean, you, we, we I, even. I, saw I didn't want to live in a nice home in a peaceful neighborhood and have conveniences. Yeah, we even saw recently Alejandro on uh, um, Lobsters kind of say, who's the one who said that the 1950s ideal family was that was just constructed for us by the advertisers? And I think that's such an overstated constructivist case. It's at that time, advertisers sought out to speak to your desires, whereas now they try to alter. They try to nudge your desires because they think they have that power and they don't. Yeah. No, and they have like, a little bit. It's not a zero. But and this is one of those things where it's like, I, in order to believe this, you have to, I mean, you have to be a true believer. It's a dogma, but it's like a hatchling thing because more than 20 years ago, I learned about because and, and I, I was told that it's like it's it's like a, a, a major lesson in like business schools about advertising and market research and stuff. But from like 25 years ago, the, the Burger King fry thing, if you remember that, where like Burger King spent like half a billion dollars or something over many, many years to develop the scientifically verified perfect French fry. And then they introduced it, and nobody bought it. And the same happened. They with went new back Coke. to the old fries. It was, it's what happened with New Coke. They thought yeah, everybody Coke. liked New Coke. Yeah, <laughs> like I mean, um, and that's things like something because like advertising fails most of the time. Like most advertising campaigns are like probably a wash or a loss. You know, like the ones that really, really work are the exceptions. Yeah, and there are things that that tap into some sort of mimetic, or you could say like a Petersonian. Yeah archetypal thing that actually speaks to the people and you get them to purchase something or feel that See, like, although sorry i don't mean to interrupt oh, no, but like ahead. i wonder like what if there is like a projection thing here because like for guys like us the advertisers go you want this and we go ah not really right now i wonder if the people who think that the world works like that i mean maybe maybe this explains the transgender for a minute from a moment because yeah, like, it, they it hear is, like it, it's the constructivist mind we're born in the wrong body and he goes oh i guess so and like it's like <laughs> And, and I drove here in my Tesla and I'm sucking my Starbucks out of my Stanley cup and I'm transgender because yeah. they told me so. Yeah. It, I mean, it's not a zero. It happens for sure. It has some yeah. of that power, but it doesn't have the mass cultural power that they're claiming the Mad Men did of the fifties. Yeah. The Mad Men of the fifties were just far more getting in tune with mirroring back what yeah. the people would respond to that would sell. And nowadays they've gotten all sorts of hubris and all sorts of belief be behind their engineering constructivist views and think that they can alter society. Uh, this is just a little quip that I thought it goes along with the hippie thing. And Say the weird thing. Metalheads are really nice people cosplaying as mean people and hippies are really mean people cosplaying as nice people. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is true. That is true. Like the hippie, I, I hung out with metalheads in high school, and like 
Because yeah, they were all like fucking hardcore. But like when it came down to it, they were like the like the baby lovingest, puppy pettingest people you'd ever want to meet. <laughs> oh yeah. I think it's also true. Like, I mean, so much of uh what I work around nowadays are kind of what South Park is lampoon and they're kind of ex hippie capitalists. And that, that's basically what the boomers or the people, the worst part of the boomers that people are complaining about, they're ex hippie capitalists. And it's totally that bottle water, bottle water, bottle water world. Pilates. Yoga, bottle water, bottle pilates, <laughs> bottle water, bottle water. Pilates. And pilates. then they're monsters uh, to, to the, to the help type deal. But, Anyway, that's just something I yeah, wanted you, to get also, if, you, if you look back at advertising, you also have to like <laughs> advertisers are always are historically we're always just a tiny bit behind everything else, like only yeah. like a little bit. But like as soon as it, if you look back, as soon as the hippies like kind of became more of a dominant ish culture for a certain market, then the advertisement switched to that. <laughs> that's not what yeah, it is now. Sure. Like I'm now. Not- you know, now it's just like, and, and you can also get, like, like see the difference. You, you, you can, can see the like, difference in Super Bowl ads. ads. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Super like Bowl Super Bowl ads, ads, like twenty years ago, it was like beer and funny and all this sorts of stuff reflected what the people watching the the football game actually wanted, and now it's altered into some sort of social engineering crap, and everybody just hates it. Like, no, you do not have that power that you think you have to complete a little bit, a little bit, but. Not 100% like you guys believe it to be. Oh, now here's the other, like, where this even gets even more nefarious on the societal level. Like, a week ago, uh, Sabina Hossfelder had a thing, a, a short video where she talked about how, like, apparently, like, and this is the thing that's not news because, of course not, but, like, apparently it's come out that all of the uh, um, highly recyclable plastic that was introduced in the 90s by all of these giant chemical companies mm-hmm. is not all that recyclable no, and they no. always knew it and we've always known it and i remember john stossel saying so in the 90s i remember but everybody bullshit, wanted to go along with it show covered it like in the 90s yeah yeah but people like people really 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 wanted it to be true they wanted to believe in in highly recyclable biodegradable plastics and it was always just a big fraud but the flip end of that is the 1950s ideal that people claim they want to go back to or whatever and they say why was well that was just invented by people and whatever in the night no it wasn't like no like that was speaking to an ideal that that people with money and leisure time just had just had in a post-war era it it was (laughs) I mean, like when I was in catering, for example, like we, you know, we had some pretty high profile clients um, and like, you know, so like I kind of get to see like the, the insides of places I would not ordinarily get to go. And like, and there's absolutely a part of you who's like, God, wouldn't it be nice? Like, can you just imagine like, like all the space? All the space, and then this is your space, you know. But like, I also just kind of feel like eh, it's too much for me. Like, I, I don't want to worry about this much stuff. Like, but that doesn't mean I wouldn't like to have more than I do, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I don't want, yeah. I don't want the mansion thing, you know. Like, I, I, I know that I learned this lesson when I, um, the very first time I ever went to Vegas, we went with our friend whose mom was a high roller. So I spent four nights in the penthouse at the Rio, and I remember, like, on like after night three, like one night to go. Just thinking like, man, I really just want to go home. I want to sleep in my shitty bed <laughs> and I want hot dogs and macaroni and cheese. I'm sick of lobster. I'm sick of people offering me alcohol. I'm, you know, I used like- to joke when I was a kid, like I drove this shitty Geo Metro and I hated it when my parents got it. And like I, I wanted to like put like the the license plate. I wanted to say spanky on it. And all my <laughs> friends like called it like the rockers Geo and all this stuff. And after a while, I started joking around. One time, this will blow people's minds. I remember one time I drove all the way to... Uh, St. George and Vegas on eight dollars of gas. Um, but <laughs> that was nineteen ninety. Was that nineteen ninety nine? Ninety six. I remember buying and, gas for eighty one cents a gallon in nineteen ninety nine. And that geo would get like so like fifty miles per gallon or something like that. And I got all the way down there. I used to joke if I was ever a rich guy, I just have every color of geo metro. That's all. I'd ever get. <laughs> but, uh, I was like, like when I went to the UK because like I I reserved the smallest car available. Like I just give me the teeny weeny uh, car. And the guy they're like, hey, do you want the bigger car for almost no more money? I'm like, no. 
No, I'll, yeah. I'll take the little itty bitty car. Thanks. So something to go along with that. I don't know if you guys have TikTok at all, but if you were watching TikTok at all this week, it was just almost completely overloaded with J Lo hate. Like no, they no hate. Like the whole J-Lo. world is turned on J on J Lo big time. Why? And it has all to do with that movie that I showed you that was basically like the new Neil Breen oh, movie. Yeah. Like I, I am here now, and that's I her, that her movie. Terrible. Oh yeah. And it sounds just like the Neil Breen movie, but then she made a documentary about it, and the documentary just shows it. And then people are just sharing, tons and tons and tons of people are just sharing their stories of dealing with J Lo as some sort of service worker, and that she's just a terrible monster to people, like <laughs> just is horrible to them. And I'm telling South you, Park got it right. <laughs> TikTok is just overloaded with it, and you you think like, who has had anything but everything in the world ever for the past 30 years of her life and she still just tries to go around touting that she's jenny from the block yeah. and at, uh, at like, the same time like, she's just the worst of worst monsters of of over bloated over pampered celebrities I feel like there's an awful lot of stuff in south park that i really think is informed because they are in that world and they're connected that must like, be. I don't. I. I. I think they. They probably have like enough personal knowledge to know what kind of person J Lo is that they just knew exactly what to do. Well, oh, you sure. have to. If you look at that movie and how terrible it was, you have to actually assume that she's a huge bitch. And like the reason you'd have to assume she's a huge bitch is because if she wasn't, like someone, someone would have been like. This is terrible. I don't get why um, Ben Affleck is going for her, man. Like Risto, never mind Fierro's. Remember Pontiac? He's not even Pontiac anymore, let alone Fierro's. <laughs> um, the Fierro is one of those things where it's like, like on paper, you're like, huh, two seater, mid engine. That's gonna be awesome. And then you see, oh, Pontiac. Never mind. So I'm telling you, like, so here's like a little clip of some of the JLo stuff. And I'm telling you, like, I I went through like 20 clips in a row. Like, TikTok tries to jump around topics and people. It's really weird. I don't even know, like, why it chooses some of the people it chooses. And I, I had a thing where it was like 20, 30 in a row of JLo shit talking. And I've never seen TikTok be just so on point with one topic forever. Sorry, like, is, but, is there like some? Is there some like room in an office complex in Beijing where there's just gotta like, be? Yeah, they know. But it's all just full of like people just <laughs> noticing stuff like this beyond telling their personal stories of her being a monster to serve. Oh, them. I hate a Jero. We need to make them a hate a Jero too. Yeah, like, like, <laughs> I, like, I remember I Jero, once, Jero. Because <laughs> this might this might become a rabbit hole for me. Because like I remember I once spent an evening because like YouTube has a whole library of celebrities telling Gene Simmons stories. Yeah, yeah, he's you know? a monster too. Like, yeah. yeah, that guy is like, that's one of those guys where it's like, I think there's enough smoke to know that that guy is just a giant dick. Well, she has like all these different stories of like, Ben will go to places and t- over tip the staff because he's like a big tipper and she'll go back to the staff and take the money back and say, no, you only got $5 <laughs> and stuff like that. But, Jesus. Yeah, she's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> And, and, and she says it in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, you know, she doesn't even really speak Spanish. Like, people have been joking. Oh, wait. One of the funniest things to say about JLo lately. Oh, wait, is, wait. Is she like AOC of, of, of uh, Brooklyn, Puerto Rican chicks? Like, one of, the, one of the calling cards for JLo now is to yell out, Mi gente, or has she, um, <laughs> Mi gente Latino. So she says it wrong. It's, it's Mi gente Latina, <laughs> right? Yeah, so yeah, she, yeah. Mi gente Latino. And hey, do they that's use the J Lo calling card now? Of, like, Spanish? Do they do they use the word henti or henti yeah. to like meet? They use the it differently. Way. No, I they don't. In, Port- they... in Portuguese, it's basically like we. Like if you want to yeah, say no, hente you're going be, somewhere, be, like I mean, say a gente vai, you know. Yeah, no, like like let's eat lunch in Portuguese. You say people eat lunch. There, there is, there so, is times like if it was a male and a female, and you said nosotros, you'd say nosotros, uh, and but that sort of thing, but. Uh, gente would be feminine, and you'd say mi gente latina. That's yeah. what, you, and but and so it's a J Lo calling card. Like you'll see it everywhere now as like a hashtag mi gente latino. You know, but uh, you know, so my mom is- reminded me of a, a a Portuguese Portuguese quirk, not a Brazilian Portuguese quirk. A Portuguese Portuguese quirk mm-hmm. is that like you know, like we're hanging out. Like let's say we're hanging out at a restaurant and you're eating French fries, and I like instead of saying are you do you like the fries in Portuguese, you say. Does the Jared like the fries? 
<laughs> is, is yeah, there's Jared, a lot of passive voices. Is Jared enjoying his fries? Like, yeah, yeah. Portuguese is like Portuguese. <laughs> Portuguese is very like Spanish is very passive. Some people think that like it even becomes like a mentality of the people. You know how like your language can somewhat form who you are. And oh, there's I'm always sure. these sorts of things like if an accident, if you like crashed into a car or hit something, yeah. you know, the way you would actually say it in Spanish is like. Oh, the cars hit each other. You know, yeah. you 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 wouldn't say I ran into you with the car. You'd say, "Oh, the cars hit each other." And like, and then it ultimately does become like a way to wave yourself out of it. Like, the cars hit each other, man. The cars hit each other. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm realizing that when I when I like, because I, I got crime and punishment, and I got <laughs> like, like Russian. Like, it's not. It's not. I. It's not. I got drunk. It's like the beer got drunk. Yeah. Well, I, drinks. Drinks were drank. That's how they say. Drinks were drank. The drinks yeah, were drank. Were drank. Just happened. Yeah. Every every like portrayal of Russian people that I'll see in the media is like they're very like kind of abrupt and straightforward. Like, the where's the vodka? You know, and and I'm like, so I got I got a Russian copy of um, Crime and Punishment, and I'll go through and I'll look for my favorite passages, and I'll like try to translate them from Russian or whatever. And like, there's this great, um, there's this great line and where he comes out and he sees Sonia there and she knows that he's not going to confess his crime or whatever and she's terrified and the line is like she stared at him with wild wild eyes and and then I go and I look at the the, the Russian version and it just said wild wild she look at him <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I remember Speaking of that there was something that's been coming out of with like those Russian guys who shot up the uh the thing oh. everybody was saying like Dostoevsky said you can judge a civilization by how they treat its prisoners and it turns out Dostoevsky yeah. never said that so that's been going around if you see that that's, oh, that's really? not true um but anyway watch this little clip of uh, this is just somebody noticing some of the shittiness of JLo and so this, there's just endless clips of this because like her whole documentary is just kind of like vignettes of her being shitty and she doesn't even realize it. So at this point, <laughs> I feel like we're going to get some comic relief from the movie. You know, her best friend hates exercising. This is as close as I'll ever get to this exercise. <laughs> She's like, oh, I'll never use this machine. And I think like, you know, Jenny's going to like help her get in the machine. She's going to try it. Maybe she'll fall out of it. And there'll be this cute little exchange. Instead, Jenny goads her into it. She does the exercise for her, but then goes across the room and has the assistant actually physically help her to get in the machine. And then <laughs> when she finally starts doing it, Jenny could not care less. Wow. And this was so fun. Thank you. <laughs> There's so many choices that were made here that I just can't understand. Like, if you're not interested in this, why would we be interested in this? Now that's funny because I, I feel like that, like I said, if if she wasn't like terrible, then somebody would have told her like, hey, that's not actually relatable. I wouldn't put that in your documentary. <laughs> it makes me so there's a, a couple different types of people that I think of. Um, and one of them is the type of person who always tells you the story and always makes themselves look like a like a massive victim. And, they, and you always know you're like, OK, you're only telling one side of the story. You're leaving out all the stuff that makes you look bad or makes the other person look good. And then there's the delusional version of that person who he actually will tell the story exactly like it is and not realize how much of a, of a cunt he looks like. Like I, there's yeah. this dude that I work with who he does nothing but bitch about his wife. Like he, they have no kids. He, uh, he works like 20 hours a week or whatever. And like, doesn't get paid for most of it. Like he just, and they so is, can't is he under they, 30 years old. No, he's my age, and, and he, oh. he they can't fire him because like of some FMLA clause or whatever. And but they don't pay him, so he, he like a, a whole bunch of paperwork just flashed through Chris's brain. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like he's a he knows. So he, he's a, an electrician at a at like a government site, and he probably makes like thirty thousand dollars a year because he never works, and then, mm -hmm. um. But he's always bitching about his wife. She, his wife has two jobs, right? And he's just complaining about how she never does the dishes. You, like, dude, you're home like five or six days a week. And yeah, and I told her if she wanted to go on that girls' night, maybe she'll have to get a third job so she could pay for it. And I'm like, dude, you you are so delusional that you do not know to leave that part out of your story. Have you met like, the wife? <laughs> have you ever I met haven't. the wife? No, oh. I've never met her. I mean, she might be 
terrible, but everything no, no, she might be she might be fictional. <laughs> I know <laughs> everything that he tells us about her is is like he he sounds like the asshole in the story, and he just doesn't get it that he sounds. <laughs> yeah. like no, I, he's well, not like, even he's too delusional to lie and make himself look better. <laughs> no, like because I mean, I, wish, yeah. this this might be an extreme turn, but it makes me think of this is because like I read um Elliot Roger. The, the incel massacre killer guy. Oh yeah, he wrote like a a novel e- explaining why he did it. And, you know, and I, I I read the whole thing, and it's the same kind of thing where it's like because you know like like if if I was writing a TV show, and we're like, well, let's come up with the most absurdly narcissistic like not self-aware person imaginable. And like, if I wrote what Elliot Roger wrote, it'd be like, well, no, 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 nobody is actually like that. But like, no, <laughs> like the kid, like he, in his own thing, like he, he talks about, like, he's like, I didn't get my way. I threw a fit and then my parents caved and he doesn't get like, do you realize oh, that Jesus. we like, this makes you look like just the worst piece of shit, but you can tell from his writing, like he's genuinely confused. Like he does, like that's one thing about that guy. It's just one thing that bugs me about like the way um you know feminists try to lump him in, you know, with um Jordan like Peterson. Just not feminist, yeah, with Jordan Peterson and all this stuff. It's like like if you actually read anything that the kid had to say, you can see the kid was so fucked up in so many like again, like like if I if I try to describe it, you just be like, Well, that's just not that's just not plausible, it's not real. But like, yeah, it's really messed up. And then um somebody leaked like a whole bunch of emails between his um uh his father, his mother and his stepmother and I mean because I read the whole thing I went I went down the rabbit hole with this stuff um and like yeah like it all it's it's all just ridiculous but like that kid yeah there's cartoonishly narcissistic to the point where you're like like you wouldn't believe it was real it was so weird but like, that's just to go to show like you know with 7 billion people 8 billion people on the planet you know, like those people, like you know, those those eight royal flushes in a row of spectacularly screwed up psychologies. Those people happen, you know. Yeah, and they are out there. Well, speaking of which, I guess talking about celebrities, because we're gonna get into what Risto just mentioned there. Man, we got actually got a lot of stuff to get to. Oh, uh, Crowder Town. But uh, first, uh, did you see that Diddy got uh, arrested? fascinating interesting yeah, got, what's got, that well about? i guess he's not arrested he's on the he's on the lamb he's but running. like is it well because and apparently it's but just they raided um, his houses because apparently it's 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 sexual assault allegations is all i can gather from it minors from... and stuff like that too oh yeah. see i i thought i didn't know anything about minors i thought it was just whatever but is this another r kelly situation it's totally an r kelly situation and and he got he got um yeah, he had two of his houses raided, and then there's been a bunch of other celebrities like 50 Cent coming out and saying, I knew this was coming. He was always going to go down and that sort of stuff. Like, huh. uh, speaking of weird narcissists, and there's probably all sorts of weird stuff so far as going to Candace Owens, if anybody was covering this stuff, they're tying him to possibly, uh, it might come out that he did have something to do with Tupac's death and may have had something to do with Michael Jackson's death, and it might be real. <laughs> like, it, like oh. he, he had a, uh, there's some guy who works for him as a um it was like a 21 year old bouncer type person and that guy was working around michael at the time michael died and all that sort of stuff and he's like why is this 21 year old being put as like the chief uh, or head security guy for michael jackson from diddy right at the time that he dies and all that sort of stuff and people are like dropping all sorts of weird accusations and all these other rappers are coming out and saying everything you heard and think about all the Illuminati stuff with Diddy is real and it's always been real and he brings people to That's parties great. and he takes them into back rooms and see and tries to see if they'll do stuff so like Mike Epstein type stuff real and all wow. these other rappers oh, are coming him. out saying it yeah it's wow. crazy and Candace like, is the one like who was this. talking about it, and she said, oh, "I have to stop talking about it." And Candace is another thing we got to talk about too. Candace well, is yeah. prouder, man. Because that's the thing is like, because like Candace, I mean, I'm just going to racially profile her because like <laughs> I like, and I mean, it, and it's this isn't like it's it's not like a fuck them, I hate them. Disavow, thing. disavow, disavow. It's just that it's just not my thing. Thing is that like I I cannot tell like if you were to play any one of. A P. Diddy, a Tupac, <laughs> a Fifty Cent, uh, a, a an R. Kelly. I 
very low chances I'd be able to tell you what's what. I'm just not into that. Um, for me, hip hop, all the best hip hop is uh, uh, Outkast, Stankonia. Mm. That's a masterpiece. And uh, Janelle Monet's Arc Android Part 3 Janelle and 4. Did good shit. That, the Arc Android double album is one of the most perfect things that ever happened on planet earth but yeah like so like but candace i'm sure knows <laughs> he can probably tell a p diddy from a two-pack i can't no, I she, like, she it like, now, like, that just to be clear too. that it's Connie not because was... i'm racist i can't tell a, a faith hill from uh uh can't Nine, think of Nine. another one see, no I, I had a mission companion who was obsessed with shania oh, see, so I, I actually know i know, shania. I know. See, they all blend together to me because my mom listened to like the worst. Ooh, Carrie yeah, Underwood. I can't tell a Faith Hill from a Carrie Underwood. There you go. Carrie Underwood. That's who I would have chosen. Who came from American Idol? And did you want to know what? I have a clip. Maybe I'll show it. Ah, I should just jump to it now. Did you know that Marjorie Taylor Greene was a bad contestant on on what? Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene was a bad contestant on the first season. Hey. Wait, you're, you're telling me that a politician no has a history of attention-seeking behavior? <laughs> yeah, you want to see it? What? Yeah, here it is. Please tell me she says something controversial. Email yesterday from a viewer, and this is what that email said. I was recently watching reruns of American Idol. To my surprise, Marjorie Taylor Greene was on American Idol's first year. It is That's truly amazing. Is it, does she say her name? Does she say I am Marjorie Taylor Green? Oh, she was good. No. You, have, you have got to watch this short clip from YouTube. She called, By the way, she used an alias name of Stephanie Sugarman. It's definitely Marjorie Taylor Green. See attached clip. So obviously, this email sparked my interest, right? There is a YouTube clip, right. and we're gonna show it in just a minute. But again, before I even get to that, you just have to oh my god, Marjorie Taylor Green on the very first season of American Idol. Of course, I want to see that. So, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, without further ado, here is Marjorie Taylor Green, aka Stephanie Sugarman, again, according to the email. On the first season of American Idol. Take a look. Reese Ho says it's AI. Yeah. I'm from Alpha, California. Is that true, and Reese Ho? Right now. Is this not I real? Uh, Telling my work how I'm going to miss Monday. <laughs> That's her. <laughs> I don't know how you AI off. that. Now it's time for our energetic dancer, Stephanie. Impressive. It would be a little AI weird that it this didn't come out and tell me. That would be a little strange. Yes. Okay, what do you do? I'm in marketing for cheese. I sell provolone and mozzarella. If you had to recommend a cheese for Randy to put on his hamburger, what would you suggest? Oh, it's not okay. Yeah, he's yeah. speculating. This okay, is what real. What are you going to sing? I'm going to sing Knockin' the Boots by H-Town. Verse and a chorus, please. Oh, come on. Come on to the last dam. And let me get on it. <laughs> I believe this. When like... I do just me and you, it'll be so right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I made it or not because they didn't say come to Hollywood. Well, that means I think, I, I think is, that's a prerequisite. So good, to, though. Yeah, yeah, we know, we know. We know. Oh, she's, she's. Where are you going? She said it, right? <laughs> it's funny, like oh, man. that sounds Hello? fake. Have a twin. It, but so what's weird about that shot is that the, the only biological female has the Hollywood least feminine hairdo. I, I think I have what it takes. We said no. We said no. Yeah. But why? Wait, because you're not good enough. Because you're not good enough. You're not a good singer at all. Oh hell no! See the thing is. Because I'm I'm the whole package right here. I got the looks, I got the style, and I'm the next Tina Marie or the Stephanie Sugarman right here. Let me tell you, good love and body rock and knock and boots all night long. Make love to <laughs> Well, I guess she's auditioning all over. <laughs> Stephanie, 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 Stephanie. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Oh, Stephanie, 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 it's okay. Listen, honey, okay. auditions, you either get it or you don't, and you oh, go on to. Well, that was certain. I don't know, uh, maybe she was being a troll though. It kind of seems like. I, well, I don't. I I think there's a lot of those, for sure, in that show. I mean, I I have no doubt there's a lot of people that like try to punk them. And it's like, um, and I, I bet you most of them get detected. I mean, immediately. like so, you remember listening to the classic Love Line, where Adam Carolla had like a Judge Judy type sense for fake questions. Yeah, you know, there are always people trying to get on with fake questions. What were you saying, Jared? So, um, I think it's not her. Really? Because I'll, I'll say. So I'll say I don't normally use Reuters as an, a reliable fact checker, but I'm assuming they would be politically motivated to definitely humiliate. Yeah, no, like, like I said, it's, it's just weird. Like, if that existed for the, yeah, if that so existed for 20 years, it's weird that yeah, that didn't come out before. So now. it says that she was. She said she was 23. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene would have been 28 at the time. 
Well, uh, I mean, they had age requirements, so people see, lied about. I mean, I that's know. her freaking face. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that is her. That does face. look like her face. I don't know. And she is exactly that stupid in performance. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just says that there's no evidence to support it. It's not necessarily refuting it. I definitely, it's definitely not AI though. It. You can. Yeah, I, yeah, AI no. is still not good enough that you wouldn't be able to detect. AI it. isn't that cringe yet. AI has not figured out how to be that. <laughs> That. So anyway, Crowder. That, that's oh, that's a Christ. divine that's a divine level of cringiness that takes super. Oh, no, that uh, that uh, that Crowder thing's funny because all I see when I open Twitter now is just everyone weighing in on it, and especially Pearl just sucking his dick. What is Pearl? I don't know what Pearl means. She's a you don't fucking know Pearl? idiot. She's she's she, that. Is, you've seen her. Um, is, well, I recognize her when I see her. Is she the Australian lady that dresses no. like in 1957? <laughs> no, Pearl is that she the just pearly things is just her podcast. It's things. pretty huge. It's kind of like a a whatever type podcast. She's like a, but she's she, like Andrew Tate, basically. She, she picked up doing like, like red pilly stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's like she doesn't even hold any of those views. Like she doesn't believe any of the things she says. She's a fucking absolute grifter. And I don't think I know who Pearl is. Here, I mean, oh, yeah. I'll put it on the screen. This is her. No, I'm looking at images and it's not ringing. You haven't seen know. that? So I watched her have like a whole like three, four hour debate with Michael Knowles about marriage. And she wasn't like, I wouldn't say she was perfectly like like uninformed. She had her points and all that sorts of stuff. And Knowles had his ways sure. of being a goofy Catholic. Well, and all Knowles, that isn't, Knowles isn't smart. I like He's you, not... <laughs> dumb but so I, she's uh but she's totally on the camp of, well i mean a bunch of different people taking different camps the quartering's fully on the side of a um oh i pattern. knew he would be he's 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 a fucking hack the thing, like, like, and an actual justice I, warrior on the side of a uh, not gay jared oh yeah no um, i'm sure i'm not gonna try to pick a side here like i think crowder is obviously a dick um but it does I don't know. It's kind of telling that all the worst people are on Crowder's side. Yeah. Like, I, well, I, Crowder gets, he's pissed off a lot of different people. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's no, like I, just I, like with JLo after some point, like with all the smoke, you know. I think like, but, like if I didn't know any of the controversial stories about Crowder, if all I knew was my opinion of him from watching his show, I would think that he was performative, opportunistic, um, hackish. Like he has talent. Like, I mean, I think I said it in the credits. Like, Crowder's real talent is surrounding himself with real talent. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's the thing he's really, 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 really good at. You know, like that thing's like he wants to be funny, so he gets funny people around him, you know. He wants he's to be a good, good investigative at, journalist, he, so he gets good investigative journalists. He's none of those things by himself. What he is is a good TV host. Yeah, he is good at he's carrying a good TV the show. presenter. Yeah, so he's, just, he's great. Like, just to like, summarize, Ryan you have with content. We're assuming everybody listening has followed all the drama, but oh. it came out. I've been wondering for years where Not Gay Jared had been because yeah. he left Crowder's show like six years ago. And, and Not Gay Jared seemed pretty funny. He was he was an affable, funny dude on the show. And supposedly Crowder gave him this huge NDA that meant that he could basically never work in the industry ever again. And I don't Shack know how that's enforceable at all. Yeah, but um, they they served him with cease and desist stuff uh, for going and working in other places, and he came out saying that they'd been doing this to him and just kind of like vaguely pointing at Crowder, doing that to them all the time, and said he's going to come out and talk and speak his mind, and and he needs help with lawyer fees to be able to fight against them. But then Crowder and those guys came out and said it all had to do with the divorce, and that Jared has been intermingling with Crowder's ex-wife to help her make a case against him for having custody for his kids. I'm so, sure he has. Like I I mean well and he has. They they showed the the emails and stuff like that. But don't you think that would make sense? Like if you got your ex wife it would but at the same time for Jared I would not get in the middle of like a custody battle for me unless it was like well, really you're both trying to no I, I probably would try not to either but you're both trying to sue him at the same time you're both try, like got to take this guy down so it like it makes sense to for them to team it but i don't think it's this betrayal thing that crowder thinks it is cuz it's it's really funny to me one of the funniest parts of this whole thing has been crowder's big beef with the daily wire is when they tried to haggle with him he said i thought we were friends not business 
people or whatever in this instance. Yeah. And they're, they're like, we're business first always or what. And that was one of his biggest complaints with the Daily Wire. Um, it's also one of my complaints with the Daily Wire. They act too much like a business sometimes. And I understand why. I just don't like it. But Crowder then turns around and does this fucking NDA and, and non, non-compete clause. It's just ironclad. Yeah, yeah. It's, can't yeah, get it's out outrageous. Of it. and, and he's doing cease and desist. Are you fucking kidding me right now? You, you think I take you seriously, man? Yeah, no, yeah. It, it's, I mean, with just what's available to me, Crowder looks like a, a tyrant. I don't know what to well, say. Like, Pearl, is, Pearl is wrong about everything always, so... I, yes, I, I, I'm wondering. I, like, I, I, look, I just looked her up. Like she has a billion YouTube lifetime YouTube views. Yeah, she's oh, yeah. huge. And part of what she's been doing is she's been like she had Janice Fiamingo on her channel, you know, and she had Paul Elam on her channel, and people who really have been kind of like on the uh, the truthful end of like uh, whatever you might call like the red pill movement, or at least like the voice for men movement type stuff. And so she's hearing them out and listening to them. And she had some of their talking points, like a lot of what she was talking to about Knowles. She wasn't wrong about talking about the weaponized court system against men. And then it's just, it's like the way the courts are set up, it's a bad deal or risky for men to get into it. She wasn't wrong about that. And Knowles had his strong Catholic of never reason for divorce type stuff. So I wouldn't say like, in that debate, I mean, Pearl's a goof, but it wasn't like a straight ball that like, oh, Knowles just defeated her. Oh, and... I doubt it. Knowles is dumb. Like, he's not very yeah. smart. I don't know how he like. It's funny, like with all the Destiny stuff and them. It's like you watch all these debates that are like dumb versus dumb debating out there. Uh, not to speak of uh, Kara and Kwaku, but I guess that's coming up. But um it, it was still just an interesting debate to listen to the whole entire thing and, and hear both sides and both of them had points and both of them were absolute dipshits at some times too. But uh, um, it says her name was Stephanie Sugarman, not Marjorie Taylor Green looks similar to her though, but yeah, no, like, they I said that it was an alias on the thing. But um, I, The general consensus, like cause New York Post, which is not, you know, whatever, I don't know, it just seems across the board, People seem to be saying like, "Yeah, I think it's just somebody that looks an awful looks a lot whole lot like her or something." Yeah, yeah it yeah. just would have blown up everywhere if it. Was I mean, like, I mean, it, you know, and like it's one of those things like it fits. Like, she sure it looks, looks a lot like her though, too. It, it does look. Like like and like and Marjorie Taylor Green is famous for embarrassing herself in front of. <laughs> it's always kind of weird too how it turns out like all these people in one way or another were trying to get famous in one way or another their whole entire life, but. Oh yeah, you go back and look at Dylan Mulvaney from from before he blew up. Yeah, and I understand the idea of like like it would be gratifying to know that lots of people think that something you do or did is good. Like I get that part, you know, but like like stuff like you know when I think about like the Beatles, you know, like George Harrison was like what nineteen when that broke out. Like the last time that George Harrison, like if he was sitting on his fucking couch and thought. I just want to walk down the street (laughs) and buy a candy bar when was when he was like 18 years old. That was the last time he ever got to do that, which would be nuts. Like, like Taylor's like, I was just reading today in the BBC that they estimate that the value of the Kansas city chiefs has gone up by $331 million because Taylor Swift is the dating the tight end. <laughs> yeah. I don't doubt you know? that. No, that's, I'm that's, sure like, that we just can't even to, comprehend. Do you want to be either of those people? Because like right now, I can walk to 7-Eleven and buy a fucking Reese's. Taylor Swift can't do that. I thought like, that a bit when I was watching the J-Lo stuff. Like, because you can also see things where she goes out in public and she cannot not get a mob of people around her. And, yeah. and she probably gets pretty uh, misanthropic after some time, you know, 20, 30 years of that. But... I, yeah. She still seems terrible, but <laughs> I don't know. But be like, I don't know why you want that kind of thing. Like, you know, that's why. Like, I, I, I always admired the people who were like, like famous and humble. Well, because like some of them are extreme. Like, um, Rick Moranis. Uh, Rick Moranis is that was actually the first guy I thought of. But the the one who I'm thinking is really really extreme is um, her name is escaping me. Marge Simpson. She's like in her 80s now. She's like she's my Nancy Cartwright. Julie. Julie Kavner. Julie Kavner, um, yeah. Kavner. Like, I swear the last time she appeared in anything was in that Woody Allen movie. Mm-hmm. But, like, Judy, Julie Kavner is, like, like Howard Hughes level of reclusive. 
Mm-hmm. Really? Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Like, no, do you notice you have never seen an interview with Julie Kavner? You have not heard oh, yeah. one. You have not seen one. It's not in print. No, it's in her um, contract. It's in her contract. Or, I remember nobody her being bothers in some movies, her. But... Really? That's yeah, no, awesome. She, she popped up in some Woody Allen. She popped up in the 70s and 80s. And then she got the job as Marge. And then, she, like, apparently, like, she she does her lines for Simpsons. And she goes home. And that's that. I remember that's she's in amazing. some movie, like some dinner date stuff with what's her name, Princess Leia. Uh, I can't Carrie remember. Fisher. That Carrie had to have been like 15 years that's... ago, but not that long ago. No, that's uh, Cormac McCarthy was like that. Uh, Akira Toriyama, the Dragon Ball guy, he was very reclusive. Didn't do. Oh, she's not. She was in Click. She she's was in Adam Sandler's Click. Really? Really? Yeah. I don't know how that happened. Doctor Doolittle. Um, what's gonna happen? Paris. When those forget Paris people... is what I'm thinking about. But... I bet they, I bet <laughs> they keep going with the Simpsons after she dies. Here's it from Wikipedia. In a 1992 interview with the New York Times, Kavner said she was considered retiring, quote, except for doing three days a year for Woody Allen, but felt that if she did retire, she would receive the script she wanted to do more than life itself. But yeah, like, not that, yeah, like, I can't, she's too much, but like Rick Moranis. Or some of these, like, I don't, like, well, uh, Bill Murray. I, fucking, I love this story. I never, I never, yeah, Mick, I never Rick Moranis' his wife like, died, and he went back to just take care of his kids. That's, that shit Apparently. is, like, downright heartwarming when you read about it. Because he's yeah. he said something like, I wanted my kids to come home to lights on and a warm kitchen. And they couldn't do that if I was still working and my wife was dead. I was yeah, like, you're no, fucking cool. Because he was, no, like, like, well, that's the dream of his well, career. Yeah, no, like that's things like if you have all the if if you have the money you need to to stay home with your kids, like yeah, that's amazing. But like uh, I uh, there was a bar in in Salt Lake City. It's like a famous, a, not a famous, a, a known dive bar that was apparently like stealthily owned by Bill Murray for like a decade. Really? And I heard from different people that like a, a few times people would go into this bar and Bill Murray would be the bartender and really? he would just be pouring drinks and just tending bar at a dive bar in salt lake that he owned and then he sold it i yeah. i have no confirmation of this but this is a, a legend i heard no it used times. to be they used to put pictures of it up on reddit all the time there was a oh, time frame go. where there was like a love affair with, with bill murray for doing that all over the place but now he's persona yeah, non grata because he got canceled yeah. you know like ty burrell ty burrell owns a bar in salt lake city and I have sold Ty Burrell alcohol. Ty Burrell stopped and, and watched my band for a few minutes one time. No, like that's the thing. Is like one thing I have to say because like I've I've only had minimal and in personal interactions with Ty Burrell, but it confirms what I've heard because like I've asked, I, you know, I've talked to people who've worked for him, you know, and like and like nobody has anything but wonderful things to say about Ty Burrell, <laughs> and like my from everything I've heard from people who have worked with him. And my own minimal interactions with him, he's basically Bill from Modern Family. Like he's that guy, but with a little more sensibility. But like he's just he's just nice. I think it's and funny because like you go to any jazz game, he's always at the jazz games, and they always do this. We're gonna announce a celebrity in the audience, and it's always only Ty Burrell. <laughs> he's just after while, he's like, that's like yeah, a Norm yeah, McDonald. Yeah. That's like a Norm McDonald gag. <laughs> they just do that for 37 years without <laughs> interruption. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's it's fun. It's like, it's like I've met a few celebrities, only a very few, but like oh, very few of them are people who are like, wow, like that guy was nice. And Ty Burrell, like, wow, that guy is nice. Well, speaking of which, like, I'm pretty sure that Crowder is not nice. No, like, I'm pretty I, sure no, if we knew Crowder, no, I can we would tell, not like him at all. I can <laughs> tell, like, this is, I remember very, very, very early on, I'd see some Crowder bits and be like, oh, man, like, like I even thought about, like, what if I just put together a quick script and submitted it? But, like, I just know already, like, I would never sign a contract with that guy. No way. Ever, <laughs> well, it's ever, so ever. funny because you say he surrounds himself with good people. And after that Daily Wire thing, he said he was going to scout out talent to give them a platform. And all he did was scout out talent that was already bigger than him already. <laughs> like, he didn't do anything of, like, bringing up some little guy. He I just know, jumped like, on the scouting bandwagon. talent. Let's get yeah. Brian Callahan. <laughs> Let's get Brian Callahan. Oh, and yeah, Jim, some uh, new yeah, Callen. and I think some of them even already kind of distanced themselves from what's his name uh, um, from uh, Jim uh, the, the Saturday Night Live dude. Um, I 
Um, what are some other classy, classy stars? John Stockton. John oh, Stockton. Did you know they tried to cancel Last John star. Stockton because Stockton? Yeah, because COVID. Yeah, so they, they wanted to remove his, they took his number from the, down at Gonzaga. They want to take his. They uh, Jesus. They revoked his lifetime. Because I can go he, anywhere because he in said Gonzaga something about the COVID, thing. wanting to investigate um, how the COVID uh, thing was like over Dude, authoritarian you, or something. Like that. If 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 anybody ever thought a mind virus wasn't a real thing, I would point them to the last two, like twenty twenty until twenty twenty two. It's a fucking. We were insane, man. Yeah, I even oh, today yeah. I was at like, the liquor control. store. Go, and like, the fucking, they still have the like social distance dots on the ground, and the two women in front of me in line were like both distance. It was like fuck this. I stood right behind one of them, and like, I'm not doing this shit. This is nonsense. It, it was nonsense then, and it's even more nonsense now. Uh, Jim so Brewer is. I work for a uh, state he, he government. You got Jim Brewer on, and then okay. Jim Brewer is already kind of like, eh, I don't think I want to be like on the Co Crowder show. Yeah. So I, I work for a, an American state government. And uh, a couple weeks ago in the weekly um, department meeting, uh, the new COVID guidelines from the CDC were announced. <laughs> are, you, are you ready for the new COVID guidelines? Are you ready for this? Isn't it just the, if, like the flu guidelines pretty much? If, if, if you feel now. sick, stay home until you don't feel sick <laughs> anymore. Thanks, CDC. This really is what it was since like 2021, too. But people would get like five days of COVID pay for it. But oh, dude, I would like at my work. If you called in and told them you were sick with anything, they'd be like, "Okay, take a week and a half off." And it was it was funny because they'd be like. You can have, okay, don't come back for a week and a half, but if you take a test and it's negative, you can come back tomorrow. I'm like, why the fuck would I do that? Why would I, like, because this isn't my paid leave or anything. This is, I'm just getting paid oh, to yeah. be at home. I, I ended up having, like, I mean, just because of different COVID stuff, I ended up having a bunch of time off. And I remember going a little bit nuts, like, this is just stupid. Come on. Oh, like, dude, you I know, like, loved it. Like three I days like is nice. Like pounds. after three days, <laughs> oh yeah. Um, but oh, <laughs> I want to do this. I want to do Jordan this. Peterson on that, and of course Dan McClellan said, "Oh, this guy doesn't know nothing about nothing." <laughs> but uh, I think Peterson kind of spanked. Uh, uh, yeah, Destiny. for the most Not part, me. he did. For just for solely YouTube algorithm reasons, like everybody comment. I want to hear comments of um. I just I'm curious about uh, uh celebrities. Classy celebrities. Classy celebrities. The 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 the, the work life classy celebrities. People that, actually say that Sandler totally is. If you're in the no, Sandler, no, thing. that's thing's like that's things like because I mean this thing with Sandler where it's like his mood like artistically like as a fan of comedy and filmmaking, his movie output makes me almost entirely angry. <laughs> but like the man himself just seems like a fucking mensch, like just a perfect gem of a human being. You know, so it's like, yeah, like it's hard to like look. If somebody wanted to throw twenty million dollars at me to be not funny for ninety minutes at a time <laughs> every eight months, am I supposed to say no? There's some of Sandler's comedies that are good too, and his series yeah, no, like, is almost always good. Strangely yeah. enough, but that's because no, somebody like else his, is directing. I like a lot of his old stuff. Like I, when I was a kid, I, I loved remember, Billy I liked, Madison back in the day. I liked Happy but, Gilmore. Oh, yeah. and, no, and like and like he it was like he gave like a shit back then. Like because I mean he he became a thing in mid 90s Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. And because the thing is like he came in after guys like Hartman and Farley and uh um, He's there with them. No, but I mean what I should say, but like you know, like Chase, like there was a lot of like I don't know, I, I'm not sure exactly what I'm saying, but like like Sandra came in and was a, like a little bit of a of a curveball. Yeah, he was the new Gen out. X young kid at the time. Yeah, no, yeah, there's yeah, there's definitely something about him there. Like, and he really played off the the rest of the cast in a wonderful way. But yeah, and there's new sci Then he made Jack and Jill. Then he made Jack and Jill, and you're just like, why? <laughs> Do you want to know what's so coming bad. out? Uh, little Nikki too is coming out. <laughs> That's a real thing. That's a yeah. real thing. <laughs> okay, was Little Nicky good? Because I I liked it, but it very much. When and it this came might out, be a conflict. This might be a 
uh what's it called uh, uh not a conflagration uh, a con confabulation this might not have actually happened but i have a confabulated memory of when we were missionaries somebody renting little nikki and his, I got so mad that I left the room. His voice I, is so terrible in it, but you want to well, know it was what? stupid. I remember they had a really funny line in it that was ruined by his voice because they were like, Nikki, you have what they, you have something your brothers don't have. And he's like, our speech impediment. And I'm like, <laughs> that would have been pretty funny if he had a speech impediment, but he doesn't have a speech impediment. He just talks <laughs> fucking weird. <laughs> I was talking to my friend about this, actually. When that came out, there was a scene at the end where Ozzy popped out and bit the head off the bat to save the day. <laughs> and at that time frame, when it came out, Ozzy still had the mysticism about him. Like, he hadn't done his Ozzy show yet and coming out <laughs> as, like, a total buffoon who's just out of his gourd. And and, yeah. <laughs> and at that time frame, he was, like, totally still, like, the mystic, dark lord person, whatever. And to come out in a comedy and bite off the head of a bat, it was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe Ozzy did that. And now, in hindsight, it's just a nothing because he lost all of that dark mysticism around him. <laughs> but uh, at the time frame, that was hilarious to me. And now, oh, Risto nothing. says Fallout's coming out soon. Yeah, there's I a Fallout series. I bet they'll ruin that. Oh, I'm sure they will. I didn't mm. know that uh, Sandler did a sci-fi movie, um, but I don't know. I liked Little Nicky back in the day, uh, but kind of just because it was like a kickback to old boot rocker stuff after the by the year 2000 type deal. And that's the only reason I was crazy about it. But Sandler's, Sandler's about, I don't want to say 50, 50 with the comedies, but they're not zero. There's like, there's like four or five of them that are hilarious. Well, yeah, but it, it like he used, it, it's his older stuff. That's better. Like, like it, during the little Nicky days, he had good stuff. Um, pretty good stuff. Anyway, now so, I don't remember the last good Sandler movie that he directed. Man, that Western one that was on Netflix was a pile of poop. Dude, I was I I was insulted by that. That one was bad. The only I kind of couldn't believe did, Taylor Lautner uh, was in it, but then Taylor Lautner, like I guess yeah, he's he, had he no actually, career since since Twilight. So see, like this is the thing that makes me sad, and I wonder, like, um, because you remember, like, ten it's almost ten years ago now or more when uh, South Park did the whole episode about everything is becoming shit. When Stan starts to realize everything, yeah, yeah. Shit. And like, like one of these I things that was going to be their final episode. I thought they were like no, announcing, I, like we're just. I going. really, really, really did too. But like, like the thing Mr. that makes me think this though, like the thing that like makes me feel so sad is that like I haven't been like I haven't listened to a new Wilco record more than once because they're not worth listening to since since Wilco the album. Maybe I mean maybe a little. Yeah, no, like, exactly like. The Wilco the album was the last one where I'm like, God damn, these guys. Well, I think it's because they don't put time into it anymore. I think they kind of just pump them out too fast. I, I, I remember there used to be this really thing like, yeah, like I um, wonder. it happened in stand-up comedy. There was this thing where everybody was all impressed that Louis C.K. was putting out an hour every year. So the next thing you knew, every single comedian was putting out an hour every year. <laughs> and after a while, you're like, no, guys, like, you don't got it. Like, don't do it every year. And yeah, I feel Dave like you know, Wilco albums, I'm like, stop and take your big, sweet time like you did with Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. Stop pumping. Yeah. Like, take your time because that's when you guys yeah, do no. the magic. No, and, then, like, it's like, and there are some guys where it's like, you know, like, like filmmakers where it's like, you have built up so much goodwill <laughs> that if you want to, like, take a diversion and do your own thing, we will give you a really fair shake at that. You know, like if you want to go off the wall, but yeah, like with Wilco, I just like you say, like I mean, the last few albums, like I always give them one listen through. It's too fast. It's just, like, it's just, it's just yeah, and, stuff. It's fine. It's yeah, good. no, like because like bad. I mean, I mean, because I don't know, like I remember, I read about Wilco, like back before the internet, and uh, in back in the days when I would read uh, record magazines about records, and there was always the things like if you like these bands that I like you would like Wilco. And I was like, oh, Wilco, 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 Wilco. And then one day I was in a pawn shop and I bought disc two of being there. Just disc two. Yeah, it was it was obviously from a stolen car. It was <laughs> obviously stolen. And I bought disc two of being there. And I remember like I was I, I was driving to, that fact. I, I'll never forget. I was driving to Provo to record bass guitar for something at a studio down in Provo. And like I'd listened to everything else in my car ten thousand times. Like, well, let's listen to being there. 
and I put it on. And on the way down, I'm like, huh, disc two being there. And then on the way back, I put it on. I was like, huh. And then, uh, and then my wife left me and stole my baby, and I went into a terrible depression. And six months later, Milk always I put on that music. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I like, I never like, I was, I was in my bed watching Japanese movies on silent <laughs> with a bottle of brandy, and I'm like, well, let's put that Wilco record on again. And it like, and like a ton of bricks. Thunkin' yeah. Treasure. Wilco hit, hit me like a ton of bricks, and Flip was there when it did. So oh yeah, that's right. Was yeah, but me. and like I, I, I had no neither, idea that no was the thing, like and then involved. I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to yeah. try it. I've never even listened to them. Oh man! Oh my to, God! Everything, everything right up to and what Nils Klein does to, with the solos on that. But if you want, yeah. if you want to not hate the Chili Peppers as much, listen to. So, by the way, is their best album. The best song is, is Dost. And I don't it, think I know Dost. Dost is one of my favorite songs ever. And it's one of the times that because I was I was on my mission. I, I fucking hated my mission. I hated every day. And I what my companion was sick one day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my too. companion's sick one day and we're just sitting there and I'm just sitting on our balcony listening, like eat, drinking strawberry tea. And there's a rainstorm and. All of a sudden, the neighbors start playing Dost, and it's my favorite Chili Peppers song. And it's one of the moments where Anthony Kiedis did something really smart and knew that he couldn't sing as high as he wanted to, so he lets Frusciante sing the melody for the chorus. And it's... I love that fucking song. The whole album is a lot better than most of their stuff. So Wilco's, Wilco's a, beat, a bit of a Beatles or Radiohead experience in the sense of you got to watch their progression man like you got to see right. from am to being there to summer teeth like holy crap summer teeth which sometimes i think like nils klein is just the most amazing guitarist ever he is insane he's he's my superhero but they got him after jay bennett died yeah. and sometimes i wonder if jay bennett isn't just completely overlooked as just an amazing musician no there was there was absolutely like a john paul Genius tension with Jeff Tweedy and Jay Bennett. Listen to Summer Teeth. Like it's... Summer Teeth. Like, and that's it's like Summer Teeth was Wilco's, like that was the big studio. And it's funny because like it was like it it flopped as a mainstream album, and yet it is so good. But then um, there's the legend of Yankee Hotel Foxtrot that came out, and there's a whole documentary oh, yeah. on it where Jay and and uh Jeff Tweedy had the falling out, and it it was famous because it was one of the first albums ever that got like it got dumped by the management. Then it got leaked online and then it got repurchased by basically the same management. Yeah, no, <laughs> so like, it was a famous thing where it's like one subsidiary of Warner brothers paid Wilco $300,000 for an album. <laughs> they heard it. They said, you know what guys just take your record. And like, if you watch, we won't we, like, we'll like, we'll just mutually end the contract, take your record. And then, Oh, geez. Somebody leaked the album. Wilco leaked the album. <laughs> On the underground thing, it got all this press. A different Warner Brothers subsidiary. And it's paid them another half a million it's dollars. Basically, the the, you see the reason they didn't like it because Summer Teeth was like totally going for mainstream stuff and it is good. Oh, yeah. But it's Yankee so Hotel Fox Shot is so experimental. It's so weird. They bring in Jeff, uh, Glenn Kochi, who's this drummer oh, yeah. who's just amazing. He is the drummer who is, he basically does all the sound effects for oh. Radio Lab. And, yeah. uh, no, Glenn Kochi, as a strictly as a percussionist, as like a drum kit percussionist, is more melodic than many guitar players. Just listen to Yankee Hotel Foxtrot for the drumming. Yeah. Just you, yeah. your mind will melt well, with it. I I will never forget like the first time I listened to that intro to "I Am Trying to Break Your Heart." Like oh, that, yeah. the whole drum breakdown. It's like the first like sixty minutes is a, like a little bit of ambient noise and Glenn Kochi playing the most musical melodic drumming you've ever heard. You got to get the Wilco out, Risto. And then the other thing is too is that uh, then they bring in Nils <laughs> Klein, who is just the guitarist of guitarists. Yeah. For um, Sky Blue Sky, and he brings back the solo like I've never seen it brought back. <laughs> and uh, um, really. Hmm. And then and then <laughs> they have like three, four, and then even the, one of their better albums ever came out just right before that, which was a uh, a Ghost Is Born. And oh my gosh, it's so good. And then uh, Justin, the bass of my band, you met him at the uh, Jordan yeah. Peterson thing. He thinks that what's happened is Jeff's gotten it all to his head too much. And now he's a bit too much of a dictator and doesn't let those guys 
add their parts as much. That's his theory with it. But I kind of um, wonder, like, like I mean, I don't know. Like, if I was Jeff, like Jeff, my morning like, jacket is great. Be, yeah. Oh my god, my morning jacket is one of those bands where, like, <laughs> if you never, ever, ever, ever listen to a my morning jacket record, but you see them live, like, they're like their records are good, good records, but. That they really are one of those band. like one like there's a few bands that I feel that like record schmeckered like okay so one band that I do not miss when they come through town live is a uh, Spindrift. Oh, but, they're yeah, they're yeah. really good, but that's Spindrift like live that's music stuff. That's Spindrift like live Sergio is, Leone music. Yeah, yeah. but Listen their albums, their albums are just blah. It's just flat, but live spin drift is unlike anything else. They're so good. I like I'm, I bet I, metal, but you like, but you like, uh, let's see, it says you like Travis Barker, but you want to know what? Travis Barker's a ringer. Travis Barker's an insanely good drummer. He's a really fucking good drummer. He's like the talent of Blink. Well, uh, so he's Tom DeLonge sure. is underestimated, though. Like, I, I remember hating, oh, yeah. Tom Travis Delonge, Parker's I don't, an I don't know any good drummer. He's a good I only drummer. know them from the radio. Okay, listen, so, and, and I'm, Blink, I'm partial to Mark Hoppus because Mark Hoppus is a Blink, thing might be Giants fan. Flip, you'd so be surprised, like Mark Hoppus is of like a Wilco or Radiohead arc where they get better and better, but then they they fell off. But they, yeah. Mark Hoppus is the uh, he's he's the least talented member of the band. He's the most likable member. Like, of yeah, like, he's just like Anthony Kiedis. He admits it. You know? see, like, no, he actually like, says it. There's there's a point in the in the I like feel like his song from Marker like, doing all those uh, drum exercises, and then and then it pans over to Mark Hoppus, and he's like, "I can barely, barely play my instrument." Yeah. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. No, like I don't know, I because again, I never, I never bought the albums. I was never into them, but just what I heard on the radio, they I got felt progressively like better. The, the Hoppus numbers are the ones that I liked. They got yeah. Like, so here's the thing: really I, they've actually they've gotten better live too because they were one of the worst live bands ever that's I what heard. <laughs> no way that's what i heard yeah man. fucking like, I, go look up some of their old live performances and first off you got delange wants to hold his guitar down at his fucking knees and yeah. he's already not a great live player but um now like in their newest if you look at their newest tour their reunion tour they're they're pretty fucking tight they're actually good live no and yeah i appreciate young. that that one album I remember has like the, the 90s. Angel I got a new their song on it. That album's a good album. The, the, I remember the 90s. The I angel, was really hello a... there, the angel of my oh, nightmare. I missed you. Yeah. That, uh, um, I think that's Enema of the State, but yeah, I missed like you. Is that Enema of the State? I, remember, I think it's I, the one that impressed me then. Maybe. But, I don't remember. In the 90s, Fender did uh, a Tom DeLonge signature strat and a Mark Hoppe signature bass. <laughs> and it pissed me off because they were they were both the same thing. It was like a strat and a P bass, but instead of two or three pickups, it was one pickups. And instead of a volume and a tone knob, it was just a volume knob. And oh, instead yeah. of four hundred dollars, it was five hundred dollars. And I'm like, you yeah, yeah. you well, dickheads, the, the, you're selling us long. less guitar for more money because you put blink one eighty two on it. The Delon signature now is a dot. So that's, oh yeah, yeah all right, dude. That's an improvement. Boy, we we've is... gotten off on pop stuff really bad, and there's so much still to talk about about oh, uh, yeah, Mormon let's... crap. Oh, yeah. talk about Mormons. <laughs> uh, so oh, let's talk right through. It, <laughs> um, RFM had on uh, or talked about a new affidavit or whatever that was put out on him by Rosebud. And I listened to that before it came on. And I got to say, it was stupid of her to put that because it's basically just complaining that a lawyer said mean stuff about me. And it's stupid. But she had points in that that were not wrong. And RFM is being stupid uh, of trying to cover it up. And one of the things that she brought up in both of those things, and he even mentioned it in this podcast, that investigations could not be done through the EEOC because uh, John DeLynn doesn't have 15 people in his company. And then that's why she went and tried to file in New Hampshire or whatever, where it would only be six. And then he got out of that investigation by saying, oh, I didn't even have six because I didn't pay the sixth member. And that's why investigations were never done. He breezes over that like it's no big deal. Yeah. It was a big deal. Oh. There was no he investigation got out on a technicality. that could not have been done. She was right about that. It's one of those things where it's like the cops found the $50,000 of cash and six pounds of cocaine, but they didn't have a warrant. 
Exactly. Like, like it, that's it's, the situation. That, so I, I our got, is over that. She's not wrong about that. I angered everybody because I was one of the first people to comment on that before it came out. And I, I did yeah, on YouTube. Good... I just said, sorry, pal. I like you. I really do. But I'm committed to hashtag believe all women. And it's <laughs> funny how it's funny how nuanced ex Mormons suddenly become when one of their guys is accused of something because because oh, yeah, no. the Mormon discussions responded to me that all of them, 100%, there can be false accusations 100% of the time. And I was like, oh, yeah, that would be a stupid thing for me to do, wouldn't <laughs> it? And and this no, guy's like, like, usually I believe all women, but Jen Camp and Rosebud are the exceptions. I'm like, that's weird that when they're coming after your guy, it's the one time you don't believe him. I got a ton of replies on this right. shit. Like, somebody told me I was stupid because I didn't invite, like, I didn't look at all the evidence. I was like, yeah, that would be pretty stupid. Tell me your opinion on Christine Blasey Ford. And then I got Radio Free Mormon. He was like, what about Amber Heard? And I was like, yeah, that would be pretty foolish of me to believe all women. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Um, so there's that. And then the, <laughs> no, the clip, understand. I guess we breeze through this, but uh Maven got arrested for going and protesting at the Supreme Court. She was in she was an insurgent. She was trying to alter wait, 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 wait. She traveled from she... one state to another what? to participate oh. in an illegal public demonstration with the intent to interrupt. Due process and democratic standards. Unbelievable, oh. man. And, and on their podcast, they congratulated her for doing it because it was a good and great thing that she did. It's like, well, it's just, I don't know. It's like, watch, watch me get thrown out of this bar. Like, that's not a trick. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was something that I sort of wanted to talk about. There was this uh, whole podcast with... Um, with her and this other guy what, what was that guy he's some comedian or something and they started talking about sex stuff and she freaked out at the sex stuff christopher shared it with me i can't remember what the podcast oh was. it was it was gene gene what's his name uh i can't remember he's he's the one that runs that podcast with her morgan did an interview with them um kevin says blood blood sugar sex magic is their best album i knew we were going to disagree I knew Kev <laughs> Kevin was going to like old peppers and I was going to like not as old peppers. Here's a fun. Raven Raider. needs a new Here's car. A, Maven needs a new car. And, oh, Gene uh, Hudson. That's his name. Here they are cheering her getting yeah, arrested. Of, uh, newspaper articles around this area. But if you want to support Maven's efforts, send her a note. Tell her thanks. So we're supposed to send Everybody money. Have a good day. Tell her thank you for being good. an insurgent. And, um, what is the actual case? Justice way future of abortion pill. I just know that that headline is designed to not tell me what's happening. So this is a, I won't have Welcome the exact clip on this uh, episode here. I guess I'll post it in. This I guy starts that. talking I about sex. It was Joel stuff. Haver for a second. <laughs> yeah, he looks like him, doesn't he? Um, I don't know. Maybe I can find the thing but he just starts talking about sex a little bit and she just stops in his track and says some of us don't like sex okay <laughs> you know do you know <laughs> what <laughs> yeah she's just like you you see her just freak out because uh oh man he's talking about bdsm and stuff like that and she's like listen some of us don't like sex and that's totally like a perfectly good uh identity yeah. the first thing that i did is i had to murder some people so I murdered. People <laughs> from the thing. Uh, I only did what I wanted to do, right? So for me, for me, a lot of that was was around sex stuff, right? So I was like, I want to go, I want to go have a bunch of sexual experiences. I want to go be a little bit of a slut. I went, I went, and I hired a, a dominatrix in Austin, Texas, who's like this professional dominatrix. She did like a four day workshop where I went, and I and she taught me how to have good sex, right? And That's fascinating. And that was mind blowing. Right. Because what I learned is that and this is just one example. Right. But in, in Mormonism, we are so steeped in sexual shame. We are so steeped in sexual shame. And what that does is that puts this whole that puts this weight on our sexual expression so that anytime we feel sexual expression, we we try. We're like, oh, that's bad. So we try to not express it. And then it just comes out in really weird ways, like soaking. Because it's mm. it's going to come out. Is it something? Come out, right? In fact, you can't convince me that really happens. Not only not yeah. bad, it's actually incredibly good. 
right? It's, it's, it's healthy. It's part, it's our creative life force. It's the most human and beautiful thing that we could do. And so I went and I'm, I'm working with her name's Kimmy inch. She's this fabulous, fabulous woman. She's a, a psychosomatic therapist and a dominatrix. So she does therapy and she does, and she does sex work <laughs> what and fuck? what she does. And she's created <laughs> yeah. this really cool model that allows you to kind of like express and to find ways of channeling that energy. <laughs> that's healthy. Right. And yeah. so the, the approach is <laughs> really like going, people, is like, like, she's, saying that she's a psychotherapist. She's a psychotherapist and a dominator. It's like, what you you ought to see my guy. He's a dentist and a sadist. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it's, it's perfect. perfect. How do how do we get to the point where we we think that like a dominatrix is somebody to teach you good yeah, like, sexual habits? She likes stomping on balls. Yeah. Anyway, you mean like she's yeah. gonna teach you how to be healthy sexually? What do you mean? She's Hitler. She's, she's, gonna, Hitler, she's, gonna she's girl Hitler for sex. She's yes. girl Hitler for sex. She's gonna That's scream cunt happy. at you while while wrapping you in a dick cage and smacking you on the face with a with a condom full of piss, and she's. She's also going to teach you how to be a healthy person. Yeah, but see, you see Maven gets real uncomfortable with it. <laughs> yeah, she looks like she's about to Mormonism die. Mormonism says, never express your sexual self. Screw that down until you're married. And then when you're married, it will magically come out in a beautiful way. Right. And that and it doesn't. Never <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things that gets ruined. It's one of the so things that gets ruined. I, I want to just come in, and I, I hope I don't sound like um, I'm correcting or, or suppressing what you you're are. saying because that's, are. that's a tendency that can happen when it's like, oh, it seems like perfect. someone's going way over you here are. where like a lot of people will be really uncomfortable. And so, um, but I, but I just want to, I guess, come in and say, first of all, that people don't hello, hello, dead do mother. that if they're not hello. interested in that, of course. of course. Yeah, we know that, but I just, we, I, I want to say it just so we can say it. And, um, Welcome to the long house. I mean, welcome to the long house. Like my journey, that's, that wasn't a part. Of it. it just keeps going and stays awkward because he keeps like, trying to push back. And say, yeah, but sex is good and awesome. And she's like, yeah, but no, I don't like sex, yeah, and sex isn't no, good. Yeah, welcome and to the long just, house. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where I'm saying, like, man, in some sorts of ways, like a bunch of like the ex Mormon influencers, people are looking at, like, I think she makes her sexual anxiety like an identity. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, I have I know. crazy sexual ident, you know, anxiety. So I'm gonna call that an identity called asexuality or something like that. And yeah. I, everybody better respect that. And we better not talk about sex. And it's one of the funnier things I ever see. Like when some people come out as ex Mormon, they're like, now it's going to be all sexual free. We, we saw David Archuleta have his uh, little moment of coming out and saying, Oh like, boy. I butt fucked someone by the way. <laughs> <laughs> like, it does things like, cause like it, what is the, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Stephen Fry talking about mm. Catholicism and their view to sex. And he talks about like it's they're like bulimic and anorexic. Like Maven is anorexic about sex. Like that's what asexuality is. You're a sexual anorexic. And you're proud of just like the anorexics, like, no, 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 I'm proud of it. Like, this is me. Like, no, no, no. Like, it's okay to like not be super duper sexual, whatever. But like this, like, oh, look at me. I'm amazing because I just think this thing is gross. Like, no. You're just anorexic. People think that if so, people think that if they um, they they think that if they admit that they have like a disordered way of thinking, then that's like an insult on them, right? Or if you tell them that they have a disordered way of thinking, but you're a sexually reproducing animal, yeah. and so if you have weird anxieties around sex, that's sort of disordered thinking. And I'm not insane. Yeah, no, exactly. I have, yeah. I have disordered like I think in disordered ways about about like food and about alcohol and shit like that. I, I have an unhealthy relationship with food for sure. And yeah. you have an unhealthy relationship with sex. What yeah, no, exactly. Like, cause like, I remember Stephen Fry what? said that in the, what? <laughs> Kids. Uh, buddy, just go to bed for now. Okay. Oh, Give me 10 minutes. Sorry. I thought I muted myself. <laughs> no. <laughs> We saw hey, back. Chris is them. back. I gotta go get him a toy for bed because bedtime yeah. toys are important. Um, oh, this is like, yeah, but like I think it, I think because in all those ex Mormon uh pages like Facebook, you always see some guy who's recently out of the church and he comes in, and he's like, Hey, fellas, we're all sexually liberated now, right? I can start saying sexual things and make sexual jokes, <laughs> and they get smacked down so fast and find everything's out okay now, right? 10 times more prudish. 
than yeah. any other world that that <laughs> they might have come from. Because I just left Mormonism. I'm so glad to be free from sexual repression. Hey, who here wants to hook up? Hey, this is not a site for hooking up and for hanging out like that. We're not. This isn't a <laughs> place for sexual predators. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? You know? Only feminists may talk about sexuality here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's David Archuleta. I was a virgin. Whoa. <laughs> um, he had a thing where he came out and did one of those TikTok things of, of course, I'm an ex-Mormon. Uh, Jonathan thinks it could be like a good thing to come out and uh, yeah. uh, uh, say or I mean, copy. Because I mean, maybe I have like the video clip of it. But um, uh, oh, yeah, I do. Hold on a second here. I'll find it. But it, it's so funny to me that they think it's going to be sexual liberation and it's it's basically Islam. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, let me find this. Um, <laughs> and this is All a time, just Jared's had a dog though. I never knew J Jared had a dog. Uh he said he just recently got it, remember? Oh, come on, doggo. Come in. There's a doggo. Head you got headphones for doggo? <laughs> so David Archuleta made this. Of course I'm experiencing things as an adult that most people experienced in junior high and high school. I'm an ex Mormon. Of course, I'm a lightweight when it comes to drinking alcohol. <laughs> I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course, one cup of coffee makes my body freak out and gives me the jitters. I'm an eh, no, that's just looking at uh, a picture of a man without a shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> Ew. Of course, it feels freeing to be able to wear tank tops again. There it was. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah he he do that. Yeah. <laughs> there it was. This. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course, I was a 30-year-old virgin. Was. Yeah. Oh, screen to be able to wear tank tops again. <laughs> I'm an ex. Thing is like, are you like naked, not wearing garments for the first six months of not wearing them? I'm an ex Mormon. Of course, I'm catching up on all the swear words like. <laughs> oh, and I'm an ex Mormon. Of course, I hid while I went to the Book of Mormon musical because I was afraid of anyone seeing me cease watch something that was inappropriate. I'm an ex Mormon. Of course, I'm going to write a song about how hard it is to walk away from your faith when you believed all your life that it was the absolute truth. That was the deciding factor of every decision you made. And it's called Hell this, Together. This isn't it's funny nice. anymore, man. It, well, it wasn't. Oh. <laughs> just, uh, okay, I don't know. Like, uh, good day. So Jonathan made a list of go, them. Go get a dick in your mouth. Drink. <laughs> Have fun, <laughs> you know. But like, just leave it off a of fucking TikTok. I don't, did, did I send you that? Uh, well, I don't know. If just be funny. Like, I also I hate that format. I every time I've seen one of those, it's stupid and annoying. <laughs> that, well, Jonathan says we should we should run with it. He gave a list of them. I'll, I'll read some of them. Yeah. Here. Oh yeah. No, I, I, like I, I have to say, like yeah. David Archuleta, like like you need to focus on the singing and songwriting career <laughs> because like just. Two years ago, you were youthful, and you are. Officially, <laughs> you're saying you are, he's losing his his spiritual you, countenance. You, you're, yes, you're not. Oh no! You should, you should uh, play the thing. I, I just. You're not the spring I I chicken anymore, Davy. You're gonna have to. It's one of my favorite Shane Gillis moments. <laughs> um, got it. And that's just Ooh. what I, I think of this. I don't. <laughs> I'm like, you could do all things like, of course, I'm a next lefty. I can watch it. I can laugh at Blazing Saddles again. Like, <laughs> of course, I'm an ex lefty. I can talk to black people without shame. Of course, I'm an ex lefty. <laughs> we're going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> if we're going to be a kind, compassionate society, we need to accept it. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that automatically will associate homosexuality with some kind of perversion for whatever unfortunate reason well it's because the reason is because it's guys fucking each other in the butt <laughs> <laughs> that, throws people that throws people off a little bit but it but that That's should be funny, completely Jamie. legal if we're going to be a kind <laughs> compassionate society <laughs> I I love Gillis. Oh, man. Um, so here's jonathan's I'm an ex-Mormon, so of course I've deconstructed organized religion and am free to live without the confines of its arbitrary morality. I'm an ex-Mormon, so of course I understand that power dynamics are the reason for everything I don't like. I'm ex-Mormon, so of course I'm more spiritual now that I do psychedelics. <laughs> I'm ex-Mormon, so of course I think Joseph Smith polygamy was coercive and bad for women, and I also am really into polyamory. The nuclear family is a relic of patriarchal white supremacy. 
I'm an ex-Mormon, so of course I know that all morality is subjective and arbitrary, but my morality is superior and is the basis for my condemnation of Mormon morality. I'm an ex-Mormon, so of course I understand that I have no free will, and so you can't judge me or hold me accountable for what I say or do, even though I will <laughs> judge the heck out of you. Uh, I'm an ex-Mormon, so of course I know that all white people are racist, and I hate that I'm a straight white male. <laughs> Jonathan isn't actually much of an ex-Mormon because he said the word heck. Uh-oh. I have some clip that he sent that I want to see. It's like somebody made some sort of joke thing of like Radio Free Mormon takes on Jonathan Streeter, but I haven't even watched it. Really no, I know that was the that was the um, YouTube channel against anti Mormons, and he apparently he used to not slander Jonathan. Like he he wouldn't go after Jonathan because he thought he was like pro Mormon or something. And now should we, we watch go. it? it I, we like can't. But th I think they're longer videos, aren't they? It's only like two minutes. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, let's see. What... He said, well, what, when did we start looking at things just through the lens of power dynamics? And um, and so you can start looking at the philosophical roots of that, and eventually you're going to cross uh, the the great philosopher Michel Foucault, <laughs> kind of the guy who gave the greatest deal of life and power to this concept of power dynamics and how it pervades our discourse and um, establishes who gets to say what about you know what is right, what is wrong, what is true. And so it sounds, you know... You say that like there's something wrong with it. If you look at the life of Michel Foucault, however, you'll find that uh, you know there's issues with pedophilia, there's issues with sexual abuse in that regard oh. that are all around his life. So if you've left the Mormon church, because you have all of these issues with Joseph Smith and pedophilia or, or whatever arguments, and then you start talking and using power dynamics as your sole lens for stuff, you you may have adopted the, the philosophy and thinking of a person who, who is just as problematic as Joseph Smith. But even beyond the origin of that way of thinking. You say that like there's something wrong with it. When you see how that... I, is this a po oh. this is a post situation? Look I can't at, tell what against anti-Mormons of power angle. dynamics and oppression. no, he's he's actually. I think he's pulling up uh, Jonathan as the positive arguer. Uh, he for, is, but then Jonathan oh, sent the other okay. one where I think the guy figured out that he didn't like Jonathan anymore, and uh, so now he'll go after him. I'm. I'm pretty, like, I just think like, like there, there's a Pope problem because like that's the thing. It's like sir, oppressed. We know they actually literally then, say. Um, not that there's you may find wrong. that your life is actually. It, it's harder to have any social cohesion in any diverse group because everybody is playing that same game of seeing themselves in He's gonna do the intersectional RFN. hierarchies of power dynamics. Yeah, I know. And you say that like there's something wrong with it. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, I, I'm, if I remember the situation correctly, when RFM originally said, you say that it's as if there's something wrong with it. He, well, he I'm sure it's a joke. joke. It was a joke, right? Yeah, very clear. Like he's being silly. That thing's like you know, like that because against anti Mormons. Like, are you satirizing? He's not you're... satirizing. I've, I've watched some of his videos. I'm. He's actually very against anti Mormons or whatever. But, and he thinks that Streeter is an anti Mormon. Hey, look at this. Well, he that was him on Streeter's side, and then Jonathan yeah. posted another video where I, it's all so confusing because, like, that's the thing. Like, there are people who literally, 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 literally believe this. Shit. Oh, god damn it! This Mormon <laughs> expression added a new photo <laughs> from f 15 years ago. Yeah, but there's lip. We were that blind. Shirt. I found that in the that. DI. Yeah, my I don't have a Guayabera right now. That's my last Guayabera. Uh oh. Um, this might have been the main topic the whole show. We might have started with her two hours and 12 minutes into it. Oh, I've well, also got, uh, I don't know if I should show him, but maybe I could. But uh, Streeter made some John Larson <laughs> memes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, should, man. Should we, we should, do that? Are, are, are we out of just talk about our step on Mormon expression? Uh, we got some. Uh, I think we're outing Streeter's like secret snark. <laughs> he tries to keep it in the closet. I think he's pretty out and open now, but um, <laughs> anyway. yeah. Oh man, we'll he's real quick. Uh, Larson I didn't even watch Larson's. <laughs> 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 I didn't even watch his uh, video. It was something about communes and farms. No, it was. It was. What do they owe us? Or what are we owed, basically? And he says we are owed nothing, but somehow that means communism. 
<laughs> I, I don't fucking understand that part. So this, <laughs> this AI face <laughs> was perfect for common Man. socialist memes if anybody wants to run with it. But we made some. I made this a uh, cheese guevara <laughs> shirt. <laughs> um, so you see your commune already has six poets 14 philosophers and a few dozen religious trauma victims so we could really use a food guy <laughs> sir this is a wind <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, our Utah great Butler could disappear within five years releasing arsenic and lace J- jared made these ones yeah, um, that's all I did in, yesterday. In case anybody was wondering, uh, just this week KSL had a report about how the lake, like, we're not out of the woods yet, but that the lake is doing better than anybody possibly forecasted. So yeah. this one, and it's been nothing is, but snowing since spring. So um, this one, for some context, that thing where he says, "What are we owed?" He talks about how we should be, we should all downsize and and live like they do in Japan, where they. They don't have any fucking room. They're all stacked yeah. on top of each other. They live in fucking pods, basically. He's like, everyone should live in pods. And then he goes, room. and then he goes, well, I mean, I mean, my house is like 2,700 square feet, but like, it's okay because like, I'm, I'm making a commune eventually. It's going to be multi-generational and it's going to, it's going to, even people that aren't related and stuff like that, eventually. Yeah. No, it's like yeah. my friend, like I have my friend who is like, I'm not calling him a communist, like, I think he's a communist. I'm calling him a communist as in he says, yeah, I am a communist. And uh, and I asked him because like he derives the majority of his income as a landlord. Does he? Oh, I know a, I know I've a heard... landlord commie too who's yeah, what? No, yeah, yeah. How do yeah, you no, do like, that? Literally, like literally, like he is he is dating, he's in a polyamorous relationship with a <laughs> woman who says, again, not I'm not telling tales out of school. Her words, I'm quoting her directly. I am a communist, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> no, like, I, I asked him, like, 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 well, like, well, because like, I asked him, like, like, you're a landlord. My friend, and who's a very was, nice guy, but very normy too. He's very rich. He was a trust fund kid. He just went down to Costa Rica to look at all this real estate around all of these Silicon Valley people who have these basically kind of like ayahuasca rich people communes down in Costa Rica to to look at stuff there because you're going to talk to all these people who are into that what what do you call it the um what's that economic thing that they talk about um the oh it's like a euphemistic thing for um you save up all the money in the world because you'll do better with it the stuff that sam brinkman fried did the um the oh yeah retardism uh, what was it retardism <laughs> basically no they call it um no, oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's got like some big euphemistic thing of like why you save all the money because you'll do better with the money. In the- oh, I'm yeah. a hoarder, so I can hoard. Yeah, yeah no, like, so, like my communist friend, when I asked him, like, how do you justify deriving the majority of your income as a landlord when you are a communist? And his answer was, I have to work within the system. Okay, so I almost get that when, when like a communist is talking about like when, when you make fun of a communist for owning an iPhone or whatever. And they're like, I have to live within the system. I I understand that. Yeah, like you don't, you don't have to own land own, in the system. Yeah, no, a landlord, like, a communist in the land. Effective, and I don't own land. Okay, effective but, altruism. Have you heard of effective what I'm altruism? Is, oh what yeah, I'm yeah. Is, a communist being a landlord is like me being an abortionist. Yeah. And just being like, yeah, I'm. I I know it's murder. I'm killing babies, but it's just it's you know. I have to. In the system. So the effective I got, altruism. I gotta make a book. <laughs> the effective altruism is the stuff that all these mega rich. Uh, yeah. basically like day traders say that they're doing to justify all the money they have and still being commies or something because they can yeah. get, they should get all the money in the world because oh, they will like, do better with the money when, when they, spend a, their, they spend their money righteously yeah. not like you poor dum-dums that and are that's just uh, John's mental gymnastics and, here because he has a giant house uh, I yeah. can own whatever size house I can afford uh, <laughs> you should live in a pod my house is 2700 square feet but it's okay because I'll eventually be in a commune. In fact, I'll be multi generational eventually. <laughs> eventually, <laughs> you need to just add an ellipses. This this is this is dark. Voyeuristic <laughs> capitalism. Yeah, I had to um, explain this one to my wife because she didn't know Pinochet. So for anybody that doesn't oh, know Pinochet, Pinochet is the guy who threw you know, the, the guy from, from Chile. He's very anti cat 
communist and he would throw them from helicopters. Yeah. Uh, uh, like, I, I think we can speak. We're going to need a bigger like, chopper. Like, <laughs> three, the three of us are very, very not on board with communism. But we are not in board. I mean, with we're the not far right extremist reaction. <laughs> I am... like Pinochet is not the right answer to communism. Like, no, he's not. I, I don't feel what, like we need it, the preamble. Was it good for someone to end <laughs> communism in Chile? Yes. Was Pinochet good? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Mom, can I have a communist? No, we have a communist at home. <laughs> Uh, the <laughs> this all makes me sad because like i used to, i like this is this is like weird for me because i used to have so much admiration and respect for john larson i, know I used to wild consider him like a really clear thinker <laughs> you know like i i used to really admire him like like this is a guy like thinks clearly like is is able to like hold disparate ideas in his head simultaneously you know like he's 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 able to steal man positions he doesn't hold like that's that's the john larson i remember from like 10 to 15 years ago but like this yeah, guy off the rails yeah. this guy he's is totally another like guy john stewart speaking of which john stewart it came out that john stewart <laughs> uh, that john this, stewart's on the priced like, his house for financial we're, we're, we're waiting for the indictments to come down from the southern district court in new york but John Stewart was totally like, I mean, there's years we all said John Stewart wasn't like this. And then he comes out just fully on board with the regime. And yeah. uh, John Larson kind of had the same trajectory. But uh, if people are going to eat bugs, well, then someone's going to need to farm them. <laughs> <laughs> we said something about eat the bugs with cream and Oreos. Uh, the needs of the you many know, outweigh the needs of the that. few, but neither of those outweigh a socialist trying to convince you to sacrifice for the common good. <laughs> Oh, makes me think of my Sisyphus. Oh, your Sisyphus one's in here. I think I have it. Hold on. I have a goo man. You remember South Park? The the South Park episode is like I'm a goo man when they're they're making fun of replacement meat. Oh, did you see? uh, On the one side, like on the one side, they pretend that replacement meat is like the social good, but then there's an opportunistic capitalist who is trying to corner the market on the goo meat. Like yeah, that's mm. that's a lot of what this is. Like yeah, because that's things like yeah, yeah, John Larson in your <laughs> farmer's paradise. Oh, oh, guess who's already got the biggest farm on his block in the farmer's paradise? Once you eliminate all of the corporations, each according to need, each according to his ability. <laughs> oh. Oh man, I I spent way too much time last week trying to like look for a farm that only like made it from AI stuff that only farmed Oreos or cookies or something like that. But I couldn't. Nobody had already made one in AI, and I'm not good enough to do it. But uh, did you uh, have any of those uh, what is it, chipolotes, the the Mexican crickets they eat? What are they called? Oh, the chapolina. Chapolina. The chapolin yeah. Colorado. Yeah. I never, I've never had a chapolin. Oh, I, the very first day I was in Mexico, I had one. And I thought that's how I was going to be eating the whole time. And they were all giggling, <laughs> making fun of me. How uh, was it? Was it just a? Was it was it just, just crunchy and gross and, and stayed in your teeth and stuff, but it didn't taste. So it just tasted like barbecue, kind of like a chewy barbecue chip. I was uh, like, yeah, I remember like the very first time I ever had a escargot. Like, because before I ate it, my cousin told me what to expect. He said, rubber bands and butter garlic. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, that, that's what when I ate a snail, I'm like, yep, rubber bands and garlic butter. That's what that was. Let the ruling classes tremble at a cookie revolution. The pralines and cream have nothing to lose but their whole grains. <laughs> <laughs> all the stocking men of all countries. Um, anyway, now oh, maybe. Oh, John. Maybe the biggest. Oh, John. What happened? Oh, John. John, you were the chosen one, John. You were the chosen one. <laughs> Now we get to the biggest subject of the day, really. But we're going to start it out with a Ryan Long clip. Oh, yeah. Ooh, where'd it go? Hey, 
University professor Bethany Latique has claimed that marriage promotes white supremacy, to which local resident Brayden Smith responded, finally, someone said it. I've been trying to explain how problematic marriage is to my girlfriend for 17 years. <laughs> Our grand wizard outfit. Smith continued, as much as I would love to take a vow to only smash one woman for eternity, it's just way too racist. You heard what the professor said? I never do that to black people. Bar owner Jamal Green responded by saying, I knew something about holding an expensive of ceremony with this woman I've only been with for 12 years was not sitting right with <laughs> Now I realize it's because of racism. Before asking the news team how much enrolling his wife in that lecture might run him. 36-year-old firefighter Jose Lopez is quoted as saying, I see no difference between wedding vows and screaming the N-word, and states that he also <laughs> felt there might be something white supremacist about dinner with the in-laws and asked if that professor abroad could take a look into that as well. <laughs> Jesus Christ, oh, they've never fucking gosh. missed. Holy shit. <laughs> that's, so that's that brings us to the little debate that Jared got in. Oh, uh -oh. Christ. Yeah. Are you ready for it? Do you want to? Oh, hey, man. Pull it up. I, can, I, can I zoom in on that even? Probably somehow. I don't know. It I might be easier if you just go that. to Twitter directly. But I think I can. Hold on. Did I have the initial one? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, but I don't know that your comments are right after it or not. Uh, but I'll still pull it up. Hold on. Go, go ahead. This is the one, right? That's it. <laughs> Quakus. So I guess what I will say about this is like, Maybe it's weird to call an elected official in a mostly black area a DEI hire because he's elected, but also the guy never shuts the fuck up about DEI. So there's that. Oh, like, like, oh yeah, that's right. Because like, there's there's a little bit of a yeah. It's a it's know. a double plan. Words. Are you saying he was hired yeah. for DEI or he's a DEI pusher? Yeah, like yeah, like yeah. it's ideologically aligned with the DEI movement. Clearly. Yeah, so it's Quaker going full woke. Just... DEI is just code for the N-word. It was like, well, why are you afraid of saying that, Quaker? If anybody can say that, it's you, right? Yeah, just say it, man. You're on yeah, you're on the racist platform of X now. Yeah, Elon will protect you. Come on. So Quaker says DEI is just code for the N-word. The new right-wing lunatics hate seeing any kind of brown or black person successful. The Elon Musk slash Elijah Schaefer, Schaefer conservatize as if that's the same person, or same type at all. I know that's <laughs> the new right. Elijah Schaefer is probably a little any kind of brown or black. Elijah, Elijah can be racist. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, no, but it's like that first sentence. The new right wing lunatics hate seeing any kind of brown or black person successful. That is a hatchling sentence. That hmm. is a. This is my first day in America. Sentence. <laughs> yeah. The Elon Musk, Elijah Schaefer conservative types are horrified by anyone who looks different than them being influential. No, Quaker. Hatchling? No. That's a hatchling. Sentence. Not even Elijah Schaefer thinks that. Um, yeah. They're trying nope. to program society to immediately assume. I hate that, that it's more of that uh, thinking that top down. Yeah, I know. Whatever yeah. stuff is like. Yeah, like, yeah, no. Like, the three of us whiteys are all on the weekly meetings where we're like, fuck you, Quaker. Yeah. <laughs> They're trying to program society to immediately assume that any black person who makes something out of their life did not achieve it by any means of talent or intelligence. These people are evil, manipulative psychopaths, and are probably going to hell. America is absolutely broken, and ego did it. This is some random Twitter person saying, this is Baltimore's DEI mayor commenting on the collapse. Francis Scott Keybridge is going to get so, so much worse. Prepare accordingly. <laughs> And McData. <laughs> oh, good old McData. There, there's Derek. I don't know, even know if Quaco. Do you think Quaco knew he was talking to you? I don't think he I don't remembers know. really who I am, yeah. even. <laughs> you so. actually think blithely refuting right wing rhetorical prophylaxis <laughs> the use of left wing rhetorical prophylaxis? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good job, McData. That. <laughs> That's dishonest. I'm pretty sure you know it. Manipulation tactic. Nice. Engage with this tweet. Do you think this mayor was elected via DEI? That's not the part of your tweet I take issue with. You claim DEI is a code for the N-word. Do you not see that there are legitimate issues people have with DEI programs that have nothing to do with racism? And I don't think even then other people know. took from there. But then I, I saw him repost 
like I saw, I came across this one in the wild as like an initial post where he screenshot. Yeah, he, he reposted mine. There's this one here. So he, he's answering you and coming back at you, reposting you saying. With, oh, like, yeah. so wait, so like he doesn't actually answer it's, you. No, he doesn't. He We've got a bunch of back and forth. And he, so somewhere he down the line. He that I wasn't answering his questions. Like he Jared, kept telling me. Yeah, Jared said this, and he, so he reposted it. Sure, oh, this is, but can you also see there are legitimate racism issues with calling an elected official the DEI major, mayor just because he's black, right? Yeah, no, sure. no, hang on. Nobody called him that just because he's black. Yeah. That, that's not... Well, I saw something where like, there's that dude, Straga or something. He's in Utah. He's a right-wing guy who's totally on the side of tearing down DEI stuff. People pulled up stuff where in the past he talked about equity and and i don't know you know old old crap dei stuff from way in the past and they started calling him a dei mayor he's a white guy who's a conservative republican pushing against dei today but they called him a dei mayor because in the past he talked about equity um sure the issue with dei it clouds people's minds and makes it impossible to tell who is a diversity hire versus who is promoted due to legitimate merit even in an elected position it might confuse people but labeling all the i concern a stop Concerns yeah. of stopping cliche is a it was supposed to be that labeling them all a thought labeling them all racist is a thought stopping cliche. It, it's so then quick answers you want to read it. <laughs> oh yeah, it's just you think that you think what is media it? is to blame for someone believing that black. I I'm trying to make that sentence. You you think D E get the sentence out before you try to process because <laughs> someone <laughs> believing. That black people can only succeed based on color and not merit. That is, wow. Oh no, he extrapolated a lot from what I. This is like a Kathy Newman. Like, so you're saying? Yeah, no, like, no, but that, that's black people, right? Yeah, and, like, and then he told me I was lying. It's like I haven't actually really made any statements. I've just said, do you not see? how there could be legitimate concerns with this. Because if I were going to put together a soccer team and I were to only look for Americans, do you think that that would maybe skew the talent of my soccer team? In fact, we've done that in real life. And the American men's soccer team never wins. Yeah. And it, it's the same. It's the girl band syndrome. I want a band of all girls. Women are less generally less interested in, in in being in a rock band. So you're severely limiting your pool. And so you're probably, it's likely you'll have less talented people than you otherwise it's, would. Not because they're women, but because women are generally less interested in that. Scott, and that shit is just, I don't know, go on. Scott Adams well, summed well, it up well, very, very concisely in like a single sentence saying, Lefties don't realize it's a supply problem, not a demand problem. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. all it is. You don't get that there's just not well, enough to go around back, to make everything 50-50. It, 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 it all comes back to the main, main issue with any wokeness. It seems to be the biggest problem with a lot of these normie woke people is that they think that all disparate outcomes are a result of structural oppression. Right? That's no, the I, only possible thing it could be. No, but the whole, the, the whole thing that Quaker was saying is so retardedly backwards because he's like it's this weird straw man. It's like you only think black people can be successful because of dei no the the right wing conservative position is black people are fully capable of being successful totally independent of special privileges yeah it's the affirmative actions that. fault that like, people think that yeah, not the, not is the black person's like, fault it's like this weird like meta darvo thing he's pulling like no Quaku, you're the guy saying that you're the guy saying that black people need this to succeed. We're the ones saying they don't. And if you look at Thomas Sowell, who I think Kwaku just automatically discounts Thomas Sowell immediately, like most lefties, uh, yeah. points that black people were doing perfectly well and were on their way to doing perfectly yeah. well until all that stuff got implemented <laughs> in. Like, they were doing better problem. under Jim Crow. Yeah, yeah, no. But like, that's, the, that's a testament to fucking perseverance of a people, is if you're doing well under laws that are actually legitimately built structurally against you when yeah. a lot of the population is saying i will not do business with you and you still are on the rise that's bad ass and now you're saying they need more help now than they did then mm -hmm. yeah no like that's like i mean because we have the data on this like 
the the thing that put the brakes and then the <laughs> reversal on the progress of black people as a demographic in America was the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. Like that's the thing that did it. As Ronald Reagan says, there's nothing scarier than the government showing up saying, like, you got a problem while well, I'm here to help. Yeah, like, right. I mean, like, and we're here to help. The, the you know what was like, crazy to me is when I was reading like, Michael Malice's book, the, the White Pill, he was talking about, and I'd read this story before, but it'd been a while since I heard it. When Ronald Reagan was shot, the guy, like, he's he, he tried to act all stoic about it, and then he goes into the hospital, basically collapses, and as they're about to put him under anesthesia, the doctor like he looks he jokingly kind of looks at the at the surgeon and says i sure hope you're republican yeah. and the surgeon said today sir we all are we're all republicans and then you find out later he was a democrat he voted for the other guy he he always voted democrat yeah, I don't know. Like he I had don't... this he had this thing where he's like he's like no you are like we're on a fucking team here it's yeah no yeah no there's like the the loyal opposition i don't know what it is yeah, and like there used to be this idea in America, like it's adversarial, it's but not hateful. Like, you know, like we have different positions, but we're on the same team. You know, that that seemed to be like the prevailing idea of American democracy. But was obviously it, Clinton, the left has completely it, eroded that. Was it Bill Clinton that ruined it for us? Because I uh, like, I, I really was, think it was the Obama years. I like that it might have been, the Obama years was one things just completely went. To me, I anyway, just, this went so utterly I just wrong. remember when um, I, I barely, I was very young during the whole Monica Lewinsky thing, but <laughs> I just, I remember people talking about it nonstop. I didn't really know it was happening. And then I, I even remember, like, it's one of the few times, because I had, I had a lot of teachers that were more conservative because I'm in Southern Idaho, and I had a couple that were more liberal. And I only ever knew about the liberal ones because they were the only ones generally that felt comfortable pushing their views, which was pretty wild. You know that you know then, you, you really raise the point, but like in the nineties, that's the thing that's absolutely true. The lefties did a lot of propaganda in class. Yeah. The conservatives were all the ones who said, "I have no opinion." Don't. No, and me. I remember it because I, I remember I had two different experiences, like back to back, right? And I, I remember being blown away by one of my teachers, he just went off on Bill Clinton about how if he can't be loyal to his wife, he can't be loyal to his country or whatever. And I remember thinking, no, this is wrong. You're not supposed yeah. to be doing this right now. <laughs> and then I went into my English class where the teacher said something about, about like Tom Hanks playing a, a gay dude. And I'm in like seventh grade and, and I, I made like a face. She was looking for someone to make a face. When she, yeah, he played a gay man and I went, Ugh. and she's like, what's wrong with that? I'm in southern fucking Idaho. And she's like chastising me, singling a seventh grader out. And I was like, I don't know. It seems kind of weird. A straight dude playing a gay. I feel like if I, like I'm a straight guy, I don't want to kiss a dude. That'd be, and she's like, there's nothing wrong with that. And I was like, you. But I remember I mean, that like, from all my, I, my liberal. Yeah. Teachers. Like if, if, you anyway, like, if you could beam back, if you could just beam back into yourself, like do a time travel thing, and just go back there and be like, well, I don't know, teacher. It's just like, I don't like the idea of a dick in my mouth. What do you think? I know. It's, is that a problem? Yeah. That, that this 12-year-old kid talking to you doesn't want a dick in his mouth? <laughs> yeah. Like, is that, is, that, is, that, is that okay with you that, like, that's not a thing that I find appealing? Or am I <laughs> bad because I have sexuality that, is, that doesn't fit your ideal lady? Uh, that's things like, like that's things. I really think you've got a point there. Like I remember from like my experience in the eighties and nineties in public school in Utah, was that the the left leaning teachers were evangelical, and the conservative Mormon teachers were the ones. Like you know how you knew your teacher was conservative and Mormon, they would not talk politics and religion in school. Yeah, that's oh how you God. knew that your teacher was a conservative Mormon. <laughs> The, the only reason I knew most of the conservatives is because they wouldn't tell me anything. And one of them, yeah. <laughs> like one of them, my, oh, my history teacher, he was awesome. He would give us current events. And the, the closest thing he gave me to any propaganda was when he was talking about the First Amendment. And he asked us all, like, okay, so do you defend free speech? And everyone said, yeah. And he said, we're kids, you know, we don't quite understand what we're saying. And he said, okay, what if somebody comes in and says, I'm a Nazi, I think the Nazis were right. Would you defend that speech? And a bunch of kids are like, well, no, not that speech. And he's like, if you don't defend speech that you hate, you won't defend any speech. 
And I remember that being like a big deal to me. That was the closest thing to like conservative propaganda I got in the education system in fucking Idaho. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things that like, there's so many things that I remember learning like literally in like the first, second, third grade about civics. Like I remember first grade because we had like a little sing songy presentation about the Bill of Rights. And like, and I remember those ideas like, oh, like things like presumption of innocence. And it immediately made total sense to me. Yeah. You know? And then like, and it's just funny. Cause like, and, 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 and like, it wasn't like there was this like big conversation about like, well, I don't know. Hashtag believe all women. Right. Like that wasn't a thing that came up, you know? And then like, and all these people that for like 10, 20, 30 years, my peers, you know, like we're, we're almost 40 now. And for our entire lives, we're like, yeah, the presumption of innocence. This is an important principle. And then Kavanaugh comes along and is like, fuck you, presumption of innocence. Only assholes believe in that stuff. It's like, what happened? When did that change happen? Like, I don't It's I don't not my guy anymore. It was, anything, yeah. I don't think, I don't think, I think you're giving him too much credit. I don't think they ever got it. Like, yeah, I, no, I think you're, like, I think you're no, right. Like, they, they just went along. People, yeah, like, they yeah, just went along with it. But like because, I remember well, having this moment of like, oh, here's the thing. I it, understand. Like it's I understand why, as objectionable as the idea of a guilty person walking free is, that's still preferable. Well, to it's funny people being subjected to imprisonment. You know. Oh, like, and, I did, and I understood it intuitively. And like back, and back like, on no, this, you understood it intuitively, but most people didn't. Is what I'm saying. Because like if I like I feel like if I didn't understand that, as soon as the John Delin Rosebud allegations came out, I would just believe it. Because I don't like John Delin. I'm ideologically opposed to him. Basically, I think he's a dope. So like clearly, my agenda would be furthered if I believed that he was a rapist. But I listen to the allegations. I'm like, no, I don't believe this. Like, I don't. I, I think you had an affair with him. Okay. <laughs> I think that's I think like, happened. Like, and I think I think most, you're a dick for having an affair with your wife, John Delin. Most but, likely, like, most likely, I think the most likely scenario based on the available evidence is Rosebud wanted a relationship. John backed out. Yeah, that's what I think happened. No, I could see that happening. And the thing is, like, nobody. Like, I'm looking at those comments that in the rfm thing where i made the whole believe all women joke and they don't get it there's a couple people that it's are telling you yeah i know there's a couple no, people like, telling you. these these are all people who when kavanaugh was happening they're like fuck yeah believe all the women but now they're like well wait a second <sighs> you know they're, they're like the new york <laughs> times when it comes to sexual allegations against joe biden we're like well, well hang on like that was a long time ago there's not actual like evidence, you know, like all that stuff. Like, oh, oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. Evidence. Remember that stuff? Well, yeah, it all depends. Well, back on this subject, um, I shared with you the link that Coleman Hughes was on The View this week. And Coleman Hughes is that young black kid who talks about colorblindness and has his book about pro colorblindness and Ted. TED Talks took down his talk because of it and all that sorts of stuff. <laughs> and he was talking to all these women on The View who ostensibly through 2010 believed all the classical liberal things like all the rest of us did, the Martin Luther King stuff throughout all the years. And they were just ask, acting baffled that Hughes could be talking about colorblindness like it, like it was something from the Blue Lagoon that he'd never heard of before. Oh. you know. And <laughs> Coleman Hughes was like, no, well, you guys racist. all ostensibly believe this you know, yeah. for the past 40, 50 years until like, I uh, remember years. when cl color blindness was the prevailing dogma of American civilization. I remember th those decades. Oh, I was there. Funny. I was alive. Yeah. Anyway, um, back to what Quake was saying here. Uh, Kathy Newman and uh, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying, Jared, that there's nothing in our history before DEI that created any kind of legacy impact that skewed yeah, Jared, people's thoughts is that what about you're saying, race? Jared? Yeah, retard, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying black people never faced any oppression at all in our entire yeah. history. No. You need your break. Up. Stop lying. You just lied, Kwaku. Um, this is manipulation. You just manipulated, Kwaku. Manipulative right-wing talking points based on lies, and I'm done ignoring it. You're doing a manipulative 
left-wing talking point based on lies, and we have been not ignoring it for quite a while. <laughs> the long history of racism, financial sabotage, purposeful miseducation, redlining, and community poison by the government and politicians is the reason someone would assume black people can't be successful without DEI. Like, like, and like that, like, such a, that's such a, there's so many unstated assumptions in yep. that paragraph. Just so, so, so many unstated assumptions. Um, I won't show it all here, but um, actually, this is Warrior did a great presentation uh, I, years ago. I don't ago. know why, like, I, I, for some reason, I'm just still a little bit disappointed. Like, I, I wanted to believe that Quaku was a better person than that, but good God, what a turd! He's what a terrible, what a terrible I, position. To take. I've been, I've been of the opinion for a long time that everything he says is just fake. It, I mean, he, yeah, he, no, he, like that's the thing. Like, I don't, that's, that's why I say, like, I, I wanted to, I wanted to believe that he wasn't just a. No, he, it, me, which he is basically, like, he basically admits that when he when he talks about the the jubilee thing. He no, no, you're right. Like, he, 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 he like, cops are just being very, uh, optic very story. optic concerned. Yeah, he talks yeah. about because. Nuanso asked him, like, wait, why did you um why did you not stand forward to the do you think masturbation is a sin? And he he just says, <clears throat> do you think he looks through the lens of optics? That's all he sees. And he says, yeah. Well, I just think that'd be bad. Like, I, I didn't I wasn't prepared for it. And I was like, I don't want to look like I'm against masturbation. I'm like, how about what you're actually against, man? Because if you yeah. believe in Mormonism, you think masturbation is a sin, right? Well, and even here, he's just touting. I mean, I've got some clips of it, of like Joy Reid coming on and saying exactly the same things on MSNBC. He's just repeating everything that was said on MSNBC the night before about yeah. anybody who says DEI is a problem is racist. Yeah. Um, but this is actual Justice Warriors re re redlining myth versus reality. And he goes into detail about how it could not have affected wealth the way people want to <laughs> claim it did i mean it was real and it had like a short little period of it but you can look at all the statistics through time and that stat is like even if you bought houses outside of the areas that were redlined you should have been able to generate wealth and many people yeah. did off of those and, houses and, and did. does this does this i mean it's been a lot of years since i've seen this but does he go into how the death nail the the death knell to redlining is capalism yeah <laughs> he, he goes into the uh whole Racism story that is if you've read your your racism critical race theory bad business practice. If you read your critical the, race theory, the which I'm sure gets you have, Quaku, this he gets into the subject of Plessy versus uh, Ferguson, which yeah. is the whole thing of railroads wanting to segregate and realizing that that was financially a bad yeah. move for them. And yeah. the people it was a bad move for doing that redlining was the banks themselves. Yeah. Uh, because the wealth oh, was generated in the wealth. Even, even you know, the most racist Southerner was willing to hold his nose and share a train car with a Negro if it saved him a quarter on a train fare, you know? And you can see here the line of a black it's home ownership. It's capitalism this and sports killed racism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, like, well, that's it. Meritocracy kills ra racism. Yeah. The black home ownership had the same trajectory line the white home ownership did in the same time frame. There it you go. Up and it generated wealth. Oh, look at that. Look, and that's like actually that line was really good. And then what was that? 1960? What happened there? And then the growth drops off. And then by 1980, it's wow. That's interesting. How but that yeah, happened. he gets into the detail. This is brought up by uh, it's one of the main things talked about in uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's uh, complaints about this stuff. And it's actually a situation. Uh, this Plessy versus Ferguson was an extent case. They talk about it like this guy was denied. Uh, being put on a train or something like that. And they, they tried to show it like this was the guy, Homer Plessy, but that wasn't Homer Plessy. This is Homer Plessy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like a white looking person. And he made the case himself. He went and brought up the case because nobody was really actually enforcing it, just like happened with Rosa Parks on the buses. Uh, so, like they were ops. They are ops to go make an extent case to push a law. And the whole thing brought about a thing that the railroads wanted. They wanted to desegregate because it was financially more sensible to do so. And yeah. that's what, like, yeah, he goes into detail about that. But it also just, it's just not a good talking point for saying that that's the reason why wealth was lost. Yeah, that's um, really not. But No, there's like one of those things where it's like, yeah, like, okay. Like, I mean, for one thing, one of the unstated assumptions in that paragraph I'm talking about is like, you're talking about America specifically and the new world generally like 
apply any of that shit in that uh, paragraph, Kwaku, to, I don't know, Africa for the last <laughs> all of history. Literally all of history. Who is doing the racism in Africa? Who is doing the deliberate miseducation? Like, you think, like, if you think this is a white people thing, well, that's because you're a racist, Kwaku. No. This oh, man, is that a was... human history yeah, that... thing. Now, that's one of Kwaku's buddies was going after me, trying to tell me that, like, I'm trying to explain to him, like, no, look, you believe in racial discrimination and I don't, and you're calling me a racist. And he's like, you don't believe that America oppressed black people ever? It's like, no, I, I never said that. Yeah, no, but they, but I do know that they, I they never, objectively did. Like, yeah, no, I they no. did. I of course they did. They oppressed a lot of people. They oppressed, in fact, they oppressed the Japanese people more recently than they oppressed the black people. And oh yeah, nobody's uh, other than George Takei. Nobody's bitching about that. Of course, he's you know. the last one. So Matt Walsh here had a quote from that racist uh, or uh, DEI mayor. Well, I guess it's racist to say he's a DEI mayor. He says, me being in a position that means that their way of thinking, their way of life of being comfortable while everyone else suffers is at risk. And they should be afraid because that's my purpose in life. Oh, well, there yeah, you know. go. He's, like, he's uh, actually racist. The, the mayor that the white I people are all comfortable. Did you know that? All so there can be like an equivocating meaning of he's a DEI mayor of maybe he was elected because of that stuff or whatever. No, maybe not. But maybe he is a DEI mayor in the sense of he's a guy who pushes this crap. Yeah. At yeah, any he, rate, he's, he's racist. a naked racist. Yeah, he's nakedly racist, and his assumptions are obviously wrong. They're it's it's not true that white people are comfortable. Like, what the is, hell are you talking about? What kind of watch is here? Not only is he issuing this threat to his own constituents, but he's taking the time to do this right in the middle of one of the worst catastrophes Baltimore has suffered in years. Looks like Baltimoreans elected yet another ridiculous, petty, racist buffoon to run their city. That is How long wild. until Quaker gets elected? <laughs> Quaker, Quaker it's insane to me elected. that it, if you would have told me that like 10 years ago that I would live to see a point in time very soon in my life where Matt Walsh is more liberal than Quaku. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. 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 So Scott Adams weighed in. He says this is his best post ever. At least that's what Scott Adams says because he says it's a uh, persuasive, but it kind of talks about some of the same things you guys were just saying of who was the Republicans that were around him. He goes, Let me allow me to put a stake through the heart of DEI for you. If DEI, DEI proponents wanted to achieve the kind of diversity that is good for every member of society, they would correct the Democrat Republican imbalance in our most important company. The lack of Republicans on staff caused Twitter, Facebook, and Google to censor free speech for years before getting caught. A lack of Republican voices in the corporate news businesses, excluding the Fox News bubble, allowed over 20 major political hoaxes to flourish in the past five to seven years. The right had a few too. The lack of Republicans destroyed the re reputation of Harvard. Republicans would have ha added balance to leadership. Google's Gemini AI, literally the future of their business, died in the crib because of lack of Republicans on staff. I don't think I need to list the other corporations that shot themselves in the feet because they had too few Republicans on staff. You know all the stories. Now name something that broke because of too many Republicans. I'll give you abortion if that's your worldview. Now name another. Hey, black American men, do you want to increase your odds of success? Just copy Republicans. They have developed a mindset and a set of traditions that have always worked, no matter who uses the method. Democrats, on the other hand, are biased towards using victimization as a tool for success. That's a female strategy. When men <laughs> do it, it looks pathetic to both sides. It is a losing strategy for men, still good for women and children. But black men, your DEI does not improve your access to the mentors and networking and winning mindset of Republicans. It does the opposite. Are you thinking of getting a face tattoo and dropping out of school? Talk to a Republican before you do that. Any Republican. <laughs> anywhere. Anytime. They will stop what they are doing and give you an honest and useful advice. <laughs> and if you follow that advice, they will offer you a job or recommend you because people who can take advice and implement it are like diamonds. Everyone wants them. I'm a registered Democrat. But I grew up among Republicans, and they are my current audience. I'm not guessing how they operate. You only hear about the fringe Republicans the same way Republicans think Democrats are crazier than they are on average. Now, I will tell you, Black American men, something you would not be allowed to say in your bubble. The root cause of the DEI debacle is batshit crazy white women who don't know anything <laughs> Anything works outside of the female experience. 
Check the stats. Republican women literally have a fraction of the mental health issues of the liberal women. Now look at the saucer-eyed Democrats on MSNBC and tell me they don't look mentally ill. You see it? Sure, some re- Republicans are also nuts, but it's a matter of degree. For women, yeah. DEI probably looks like a plus. For black men, DEI is a huge source of systemic racism that didn't need to happen. Damn, yeah. that might be his best post. That was pretty good. Yeah. Here's yeah. some of the Joy Reid shit. Oh, my God. She's still going. Oh. Here it is. A shame on those people who want to make something out of this that isn't there. They have this boogeyman philosophy, and if it's black or brown, it's something that they've got a target on. Yeah. I just think that is just totally uncalled for a time like this. That was Maryland Congressman Kwesi Fume last night on this very show, talking about the rampant conspiracies being hawked by the right about Tuesday's tragic bridge collapse in Baltimore. It has been a grab bag of right wing grievances, barely coded racism and flat out lies. Noted Jewish space lasers and QAnon conspiracist Marjorie Taylor Greene suggested the disaster was the result of an intentional attack, perhaps by the space lasers. Boogeyman, diversity, equity and inclusion, DEI. A Republican congressional candidate in Florida tweeted that DEI did this. And a right-wing blue check account that's been boosted by Elon Musk in the past just blew straight past the dog whistling, tweeting to its 276,000 followers, quote, Baltimore's DEI here, commenting on the Francis Scott Key Bridge. It's going to get so, so much worse. Prepare accordingly. The post included a clip of Baltimore's black mayor, Brandon Scott. I I can't uh, say this. Brandon Scott? was elected with 70% of the vote in 2020 in a city that is 61% black. So by right-wing logic, a diversity hire would have been a white man, which of course is what they want. Only the white Christian men may have the things. Oh, fuck off. Point, it's evident what they mean by DEI, right? Okay, it means black people. It's the reason the right complained about critical race theory. It's not fashionable oh to be God. openly racist anymore in America, unlike what they call the good old days. So it's referring to a black mayor as a DEI mayor gets the point like, across, right? Like Darvo okay, just say embodied. what you mean. You can't stand black people. We get it. You've been heard. She is the iron well, law of protection and body. Like she's the like just a perfect projection machine. Like Joy, yeah. you when are mean, super it's... duper duper racist. Yeah, what like, do you mean it's not are. fashionable to be racist anymore? Like, like no, like you, like you are on TV as a legendary racist. Like you have a job to be racist every day on TV, Joy. It's very fashionable to be racist on your team. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, no, she, yeah, she's just an awful person. Like again, like I say it over and over and over again, but it quickly that if you're you taking cues from that, it's straight bullshit. Yeah. Totally straight, but no, but like I used to wonder how the Holocaust happened, but then I see like Joy Reid on TV, like like that thing from a few weeks ago. She's like, "Why are white people having kids?" Like, oh, that's how Holocausts happen. There you go. <laughs> that, that woman gets paid a million dollars a year to say, "Why well, I don't know why white people are having kids." Like, well, that's how Holocausts happen. There you go. That's the answer. That's where they start. The seeds are there. But, I mean, you can totally see, yeah, people are getting out over their skis calling that a DEI accident. Although it, was, it wasn't it was technically immigrants who were running that boat. It was a foreign-run yeah. boat. And I saw, like, a boating expert talk about it, a guy who's, like, just completely – he said it absolutely had to have been mismanaged by the people there. Yeah, no, I – Like, redirect itself into the thing, and it was people who didn't know what they were doing driving. Yeah, like, yeah. incompetence to be sure. Yeah, and he said it was likely because those. No, I don't. There's no reason to suspect that. Just on with what we know. But. Yeah, it's it's too early to say if it was purposely sabotaged yeah. or not because you can see it course correct into the bridge. But yeah. he also says it was more than likely because those people you know, use like India. It was in Indian barge. Yeah. Use underpaid, undertrained yeah. staff. No, the, so the it's Concordia not technically disaster? like American DEI that did it, but it is under training that did it. The Concordia disaster, that Italian cruise ship that uh, ground on the rocks, you know, from like 10 years ago. Like, so there was like all major disasters involving things like ships and airplanes. 
it's never one thing. There's usually like a whole, it's the Swiss cheese model, they call it. Like yeah. there's a, a whole string of bad choices. But one of the critical things, like the like one thing that if it hadn't been for that, the accident probably would have been avoided, is the guy that was steering the ship was an Indonesian dude who spoke neither English or Italian. Oh, God. And and we know from like the black box thing that like there were points when the captain gave orders, like rudder orders, and that guy put in the wrong inputs. And some people have said like if that had all gone right, they probably would have avoided disaster. Like all of the other mistakes would have still been mistakes. But like, yeah, just that thing where it's like, yeah, and you think like, well, wait, this is like an Italian cruise liner filled with like, you know, rich Westerners. But like, yeah, the guy steering the boat speaks none of the languages. Like he doesn't speak the language of the captain and he doesn't speak the international language of maritime transmission. Yeah. You know? so like, that's a <laughs> big problem. This guy who was the expert on boats is also talking about that that company, Maersk, is like a major multi-billionaire company. Oh, yeah. Why is it not on them to fix the bridge? Why is it our national federal... Uh, taxes that are going to have to fix this problem. Like that, weird maritime that law. company should be paying for that accident or mistake or just complete negligence in hiring because it was either intentional or extreme negligence. Yeah. <laughs> but well, like, yeah, know. jumping on saying that it was DEI initiatives that caused it. Yeah, they're getting out over their skis on that one. Yeah. Sure. Like, I mean, like, okay, to, to give the devil its due, to give the devil his due. Like the DEI people have declared, they have said, we are changing the standards to allow minorities, which yeah. is to say we in, are in, lower in every the profession. Yeah. Like it's it's a statistical fact that like if you lower standards, results will degrade. Like that's there's just no way around that. You know, like like you if your basketball team, like if your basketball college. team started saying like we are no longer hiring for who is best at basketball, we are hiring on other factors, you will still have a basketball team. It will not be as good. Now that's just basketball, but if it's surgeons or airline pilots or air traffic controllers or the pilots of uh, ships that are bigger than Titanic, like yeah, there's just that. If you lower standards, like there you go. What do you expect? Don't lower standards. Yep. So that whole argument was like uh, things like I have seen from history books. I've seen them. I've seen them. There have been like great um, ship captains that weren't um, straight white European males. Like that they, they have existed. There have been like lots of them, and they do good jobs, even with their like not European straight whiteness. It's the craziest thing. Like they're in history. Like you can look them up. It absolutely is. Like on that company's under training, and it should be on them to pay for that sort of thing. And under training yeah. is a problem. And I mean, like it's so true. Like yeah, like it is a problem. And it just comes DEI, out of like just, Elon yeah. Musk said in that interview with Don Lemon, uh, <laughs> sure. it will cause more problems. And, yeah. and people aren't wrong that we're going to see more issues like that. Yeah. No. Like it. it yeah. It's just that you lower standards results will degrade what and you if you kept standards the same you would still have some dei in there but not done the dei way yeah you keep standards the same there will be competent black people <laughs> no i know that's one of the quakeoids coming after me was trying to tell me that like he, he's like should we shift systemic so you're saying we should take away systemic barriers and uh then that's it i'm like mm. yeah of course no like I, don't stop black people from doing anything don't push them into anything don't stop women from doing anything don't push them mm. into that's actually black all people I really will want. rise to excellence they're capable yeah, no. of it. like have some fucking faith holy shit this soft bigotry of low expectations yeah. nonsense again but I, I think about that with women and that, that's sort of the fundamental problem with feminism is that whole disparate outcomes are always a result of systemic oppression right yeah. and and if you have that view, then any time women are not perfectly 50-50 represented in, well, in a good job, they don't care about the bad jobs. Yeah, you know, but, exactly, yeah. 
if if they're not represented 50 50 in the good job that means that the s- systemic oppression is still there because i've talked to these people and i'm like no you just you're, you believe in blank slate theory you yeah. just think that it's all nurture and no nature and i'm pretty sure most from what i can tell most things are like 80 percent nature 20 yeah. percent nurture and the nurture has to happen I mean, like, and, really and, fucking right, and, in life. and feminists get this in intuitively like it's been a few times in my life when i've brought up like the the um work-related death gap with feminists and they yeah. like immediately yeah. they intuitively they intuitively like understand like the, like suddenly for just an instant they're no longer hatchlings and they have been alive on earth for their entire lives and they go like well men have different be- behaviors than women and one of those behaviors is risk taking like just like that they're like well, well, well duh like biology explains the death gap like oh no, no shit oh. Man. I'm not oh. saying men are oppressed. Be- so I'm, I'm, you'll never hear me saying that men are oppressed because men are more likely to die falling off of a house during construction. Yeah. But they are. Yeah. I'll tell you that. And if you ask me why that is, I will tell you behavioral differences, like biologically in- inclined behavioral differences. It's like they, the people that I know that tout evolution the most understand it the least. Right. Mm. I, I was arguing yeah. with one of my, one of my co workers about, um, about what was it the, the difference in men and women's sexual habits right i was explain like he, he was trying to tell me that the only reason women don't like being sex workers is because they're socially conditioned to not like it and i was like no i don't i don't think it's the case i think if you could somehow totally remove no, the all only of the reason women don't like being sex workers is because they have a positive relationship with their father <laughs> that's why <laughs> no i was like if you could somehow just totally remove all of the social stigma around sex workers, you might see an increase of like 0.15% in sex workers. I, I do not think yeah. that there's like, there's no, I don't think there's really any healthy women who would enjoy that. There's yeah, unhealthy no, I, women. I think, I think there are people, I, don't know, they I think there are women who are, I think there are women who are desperate. I think there are women who are trafficked. And I think there are women who are so far on the mental illness exhibitionist spectrum as to, you know, like, I mean, okay, it's a free yeah. world. No, and I, world. You can do what you I want, but that's not, that's not sexually healthy behavior. Like that it's, it's not good for, for you to want the world to see you getting gang banged. That's oh, I know. <laughs> well, and I tried explaining this. I, I tried explaining that like, no, I, I think this is a difference in nature versus nurture. You think this is all nurture. I think it's mostly nature. And, and the reason I think it's mostly nature is because like historically speaking, we've evolved to um you look at the sexual habits of men and women like back in caveman days before like society it was civilized before civilization um human women are massively vulnerable while they're pregnant and for weeks after they're pregnant and for years yeah. after they have a baby the baby needs constant attention yeah. right and yeah like no like the so it make like the mother child is a is a dyad for a yeah, couple of years sex Sex for women, historically speaking, has been a massive risk. At risk, and for men, it's been somewhat of a, a very small risk, significantly yeah. smaller than men. And so, clearly, women are going to evolve in the millions and millions of years that whatever was happening um, to to be a little bit more choosy in who they fuck because it's a bigger deal to them. And he's like, "Yeah, but we beat that." Like this dude is atheist, liberal, <laughs> evolution bleeding. <laughs> yeah, but we we. Yeah, no. We did away with it. I was like, what the fuck do you mean we did away with it? He's like, yeah. It's not, they invented the pill. Now human yeah, he's like, we invented the pill. It's not, we have society and it's not nearly as risky to be a woman pregnant. I was like, and you right. think that in the last hundred years or so, we just undid millions of years of evolution? Turn that switch off. Are you retarded? I don't know, but that's, well, I don't know. Like, he's not retarded. He's religious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like an underlying thing with so much of what we've been like talking about in the uh, arguing for here is like these guys are arguing against the cosmos and we're arguing with it. You know? yeah. And uh, it's always an underlying theme. Um, I've got like 10 other freaking topics we could go into we but went, it's been three not, hours. And yeah, no, I, I want to go to bed. We were so, not great podcasters today. We ended up talking about 311. It's, it's weird. Like, <laughs> I, I hate 311, and yet I have devoted like 186 hours of my life 
to like aggregate like, yeah like if i if there's an afterlife like god how much time did i spend talking about that band i ate <laughs> jesus christ kid <laughs> yeah. like, that's why that's why i made hell that's okay well we probably won't come back to him so i'll just uh rapid fire some of them uh the soft white underbelly guy uh, oh. he had oh, a yeah, whole podcast wild. about helping all these uh, homeless people all the time and like, he's decided to stop he's all GoFundMes because it's turned out in every single case that they just get angry at him take the money and use it on drugs yeah. and the they money just the money, goes down a hole and up. then they tell they tell the people that he never gave them any money when he's given them hundreds of thousands of dollars um, he put out a uh, small podcast about it and tiktok yeah, talking about yeah. why he's stopping all gofundmes for the homeless people he's been featuring on his uh, channel this is the uh, thing like i think that no like, way fundamentally misunderstand about homelessness because like there have been periods in my life that i did not have a place to stay that was my own but there has never been a time in my life that i wasn't welcome somewhere <laughs> Yeah. Right. And like, and this is the thing about like homelessness, not people who are down on their life and they're lost at home. The chronically homeless. Like, there's something going on to where like you it's not just arbitrary that they're not welcome anywhere, you know. Like, there's a lot of people that you might meet randomly and still say, like, I trust you enough to give you a place to sleep tonight. There's a reason why nobody takes the homeless home. It's in fact, it happened in Salt Lake Mormon. City. It happened in Salt Lake City just a couple of years ago, where a nice lady just a couple blocks away from me encountered a homeless guy, tried to be nice, and she and the homeless guy tried to murder her in her home. I think she survived. Jesus. But like, who, you know, it was just yeah. It was just who like, was the piece of shit who told her that was a good idea? Like, because I well, think like, of the the I think of that that woman, the Pipa Boca or whatever, the the oh, French yeah. lady who who's put on a wedding dress and hitchhiked across the Middle East and was just oh, immediately yeah. raped and murdered. Yeah. I was like, mm -hmm. fuck, this is, you're a, you're a fucking idiot, but this isn't even your fault. There was a like, bunch of people who should have told you this was a terrible idea, and they're like, well, well I'm not racist, so I'm not going to tell you that you're way more likely to get raped check, trekking across the Middle East. Reality like, can't be real, man. Earlier this week, I uh, I was shooting over to my parents' house, and I was in a hurry. So, like on the getting on before I got on the freeway, I stopped by the McDonald's there on Six South to get something to eat real quick. And there was a homeless guy, and I saw him hanging out by um, the ordering thing that was completely smashed up by a homeless guy. So I went to the ordering thing that wasn't smashed up, and the guy came up. He's like, mumble, mumble, mumble. I'm like, I don't have cash. He's like, mumble, mumble. I'm just hungry. And I'm like, all right, I'll buy you food. What do you want? And he said, vanilla shake. And I'm like, well, okay, hang on a second. Like, <laughs> here I was thinking I was buying you food. Like, now a burger, like, I mean, you know, it's not ideal food, but there's carbs and protein, right? <laughs> but like the vanilla shake, but I did it. I did it. I bought the guy a vanilla shake and I gave it to him. And that was my good deed. But like, because, you know, because that's the thing is like, because normally I'm just like, you know, I just have like, I don't have money. I can't help you, you know, but like, I just had this moment. I'm like, well, I'm not a monster, you know, I'll buy you food. And then like, but I just had this kind of moment. I was like, well, wait a sec. Did I help? What did I just do? I bought you a vanilla shake from McDonald's. Did this that is... help anything? And I just, I don't know. I don't think no, so. This is an argument that's becoming more prevalent, especially in lefty spaces is like me saying, well, okay, I don't want to give a homeless guy money if he's just going to buy drugs with it. And, like, that used to be just a common thing that everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. felt. And then like, if you buy him food, that just means that the $10 he was going to buy food with will now be purchasing drugs. That's yeah, what that well, means. And now I get chastised for that view. They're, they're like, it's none of your business what he buys it with. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, it's a little bit. It's a yeah, little a bit. A little bit, because I'm giving him the money. And they're like, the second you give him the money, it's his money. So it's not your money anymore. So why would you care what he because I want to help him. And and if I give him money and he buys booze with it, I'm not helping him. I'm actually I'm I'm actually harming him. I'm causing harm. Hmm. But I'm the asshole. Yeah. Well, there's that subject. Then uh the uh, both the Mormon stories and the Ward Radio both had female only episodes this week to talk about girl power. 
And uh, that was super exciting. Also, one little clip of what we missed not talking about this. I don't know if I'll ever stop crying about Mormonism. <laughs> God damn it. That's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a... That was one... That was one of the stupidest Mormon stories episodes I've seen in a long time. Well, the Ward Radio one with all the women. And you want to know funny part? Are like, there's no guys know? on either episode. We're letting women talk. And uh, yeah, I don't I know. know. That stuff you, you just wanna... comes across as so doinky to me. <laughs> so here's the funny part is that um, we played a battle of the bands in, at Velour in Provo. And um, Mendy Gledhill was there. She was one of the judges. And the band that ended up winning was a girl band. And here's the thing. They deserve to win, or at least the, they're the, the best the that night front, the front woman, basically the, the, the lead singer, she deserved to win. She was a stupendous. Like, she, she was an amazing performer, great crowd work. Great. She could belt a tune. The rest of her band was dog shit. Like they were terrible. The drummer was off beat. The bassist looked like she had never touched a bass before that month. And the guitarist was ah, like four chord Taylor Swift style. And that's the only part that annoyed me. And it was funny because one of my, like my other guitarist, he was over there. He actually went and talked to Mendy Gledhill because he, he helped manage Velour and was asking her about like, Oh, how do you think we did? And she's like, you know what? You guys did a, a really good job. And this, this, you know, this girl band, like, other than the lead singer, they kind of suck. Like, so she was being pretty honest and forthcoming. So <laughs> I kind of had hope for her to be <laughs> a reasonable person, but it was all patriarchy in this fucking episode. <laughs> yeah. We should have a female only episode talking about female problems and just have all guys on it. And, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> We're females for this episode. <laughs> mansplain, a mansplain episode. The female, do women have power? Mansplained. <laughs> um, yeah that was a whole thing i guess that's it there's some other little crap and it's all just a little crap maybe i can save it for next week but i'll probably forget about them but no i always yet. like every week i always have things like i'm gonna talk about and then i don't think of them and then like three days from now i'm like oh that's right you should write them down like write them in your thing and then uh, try to see things like all my life i've thought about like i will get a thing to write the things down that i forget but then i just lose the thing yeah, oh. well, it's uh, you could do like a Google Doc. That's what Jonathan tried to do when we were doing the. Oh. the Jonathan is like one of those put together people that like accomplish. Things. Yeah, we still need to finish our letter to uh, CS, our CS letter <laughs> to the ex Mormons yeah. and all that stuff. We need to get lazy about doing, but uh, and I and I still need to make my uh song. Your Oliver and all the Anthony stuff I will do, and now we're gonna do a uh, nerd cast episode of <laughs> yeah. excited oh, yeah, yeah. about dumb things. And uh, now we need to do a female only mansplained episode. And uh, we just keep racking trauma them up and then we never get around to doing them. We got to um, make the trauma knackle. And Jonathan <laughs> thinks we should uh, actually make some of those. I'm an ex Mormon. Of course I had this or that. Type no, of I've been thinking about doing that for, I, cause I've seen this irritating format for a while though. We're dinks. Of course we just go home and smoke pot and it's awesome. Cause we don't have kids or whatever. I, I've seen that format and it I was like, man, that'd be fun to parody, but God, I'm so lazy. Yeah. Our laziness yeah. keeps holding us back from being great. But uh, uh any booze corner okay. clip? Uh I know that I changed my name because I'm He's doing the good thing. Helping women by drinking wine. So somebody this was a, a cheap Spanish rose that uh, uh, somebody ordered for an event that got canceled. Women were probably running it. That's probably why it failed. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good booze corner. Um, anyway, this next week, I've got a gig next Thursday. So either these guys will run it on Thursday or uh, we might do it on Wednesday. We'll figure it out. If Flip writes down writes down all of his things that he means to talk about or remember, he, maybe you guys can just Wait, roll oh, do you on have, Thursday. Do you have an autistic hero? Uh, I didn't have an autistic hero. I mean, although there's I mean, gotta be somebody, a whole math. Well, uh, I didn't have a whole math. Uh, I oh, I saw a whole math. Rip this off week and math I didn't think week? it was that good. Oh. Uh, well, it wasn't like that crazy good. I've got a uh, bro bro uh, science. Bro, bro science? science. Those are fun. You remember the bro science? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, one on bro science. He's pretty autistic. <laughs> 
Uh, pretty. There are health benefits to being natty. For instance, you'll live longer. If you want to be here for a long time, not a good time, then not steroids. <laughs> if you go to run the race as long as you can without winning, then your best bet is to stay natty. But let me ask you something. Have you ever tried life? It fucking sucks. It's a <laughs> You're born against your will with the combined genetics of potato salad, and then you expect it to play this shitty hand for as long as you can until you die? And the only thing that makes life bearable is the gym. So why not risk it all and go all in? And yeah, sure, you might die at 29 because your heart is the size of a melon. But you know what they say, gear size, full hearts, can't lose. Being natty is like getting a life sentence to a minimum gains prison and then getting more time for good behavior. I'd rather die young and huge <laughs> from unnatural causes than old and small from natural causes. Gears over years, baby. This one might actually get better <laughs> over here. There are health benefits to being that. Uh, <laughs> That's amazing. That, that, that was a no sugar, no happy diet update. No, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so there, All we covered right. enough. So Write down your things, Flip, and uh, maybe maybe you can uh, run one on the topics and stuff if you remember all the subjects, or we'll do a Wednesday, or uh, you could do a, yeah. an all-female uh, Thursday or something. So, <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for hanging right. and listening to our pop music. Wait, so like, we got Marty, and we got Morgan. Marty and Morgan. We should have, like a yeah, the girl episode. Who else can we get in to, to be our girl episode? They could tell us, like, well... Morgan can tell us that we're not nice, and then she can drop some of the, like the harsh stuff that I constantly yeah. see drop. Like, no, Morgan. <laughs> Morgan's one of the meanest people I know. <laughs> she drops some harsh memes, man. She's so. been on that kick lately yeah. where she's trying to talk to everybody about how what if homosexuality is like a mental disorder or something. Like that. She, <laughs> she keeps just dropping that on people, and they're like, "Yeah, she actually says like, that in real life." I thought she was just saying that in private. <laughs> so, no, yeah. I mean, she's saying it to all of her siblings and shit. And that's the thing about Morgan is she, I just hear like randomly like, calling like on the phone book, just dialing numbers, like. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, she's not. What even, if like, a well, it's just a mental illness? Yeah, but she's not. She's not even a dick about it. She's just like making a like. You know what? I I think this maybe isn't just like a born this way type thing, and everybody is super uncomfortable with it. And she like doesn't get it. And I'm like, look, I love you. You're the autistic hero right now. There's she's our autistic hero of the week. I'll put it up. Morgan is our <laughs> Morgan is the autistic, autistic hero of the week. <laughs> this is one of her memes she posted. In. <laughs> the state starts wi ass wiping program. People in five years without the government, who would wipe our ass? <laughs> All right. Okay. Chick, cool. chick flick next time. Chick flicks. Watch chick Lawrence flick, of yeah. Arabia, everybody. All right. Catch you later. All right. See ya. Have a good one.